It's the longest minute. In <laughs> All righty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting for Tuesday, January 9th. We will begin with a flag salute led by Supervisor Gore. Our next Board of uh, Supervisors uh, item is selection of officers. It's a selection of the 2020-24 chair. Uh, first of all, I've enjoyed being the chair this year. It's been a very busy, I forget how many, we've been had at least 36 meetings, uh, including workshops. Uh, but we moved everything along. I think uh, we did a pretty good job coming uh, to agreement on 99.9% .9 of the items. So, um, again, it's been my great pleasure to be the chair in 2023. And now I'll open it up for uh, nominations. I'd be happy to make a motion that um, Supervisor Jones become the chair and Supervisor Gore be the vice chair. All right. I will second that. Okay. Are there any other nominations? I will close the nominations and um, all those in favor of the action taken by Supervisor Gustafson and Supervisor Landon, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstention, hearing none, I will be glad to turn over this meeting to you. Don't go anywhere just yet. Oh. Because on behalf of the entire board, yeah. and I'm sure a lot of, and the staff, Placer County staff, we'd like to present you with this plaque in commemoration of your year as our chair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very so, much. Congratulations. Yeah. And thank you for your service. It's yeah. been great. And thank you for mentoring me. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to add another room on my Hall of Achievement. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and um, thank, you for, thank you for that. I'm really excited to be here. So let's go to the next item is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the county executive department. The board will convene as the successor agency for item 25A and 25B. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote. Anyone may ask to uh, address consent items prior to the board taking action and the item may be removed for discussion. Is there anything on the consent agenda that uh, you would like to have pulled? Madam Chair, yes. um, item 19A, I'd like to pull for a quick discussion. Okay. And do I need to pull that other one off? We will after you ask if anybody in the public oh, Okay. So. All right. Does anyone in the public have uh, an item on the consent agenda that you would like to have pulled for discussion? Yes. 15A, okay. All right. So then we start with those, right? So Chair, we, have, we have one on the side. Oh, okay. I need to check. I don't know if they want their item pulled or not. Okay. Wes, are you looking to pull an item from consent? Or are you waiting for public comment? Mr. Moody, are you looking to pull an item from consent or give public comment? Okay, okay, so which item do we start with? In Can I make a motion for the remaining items? Oh, yes. To approve the remaining Please. items. I'll second. Okay, I'll. Uh, uh, okay, roll call vote on that. Gore? Mm -hmm. Aye. Landon? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Gustafson? Yes. Jones? Aye. Okay, so then which one do we begin with? 15A. 15A. Okay, let's begin with 15A. Please come forward and um, we'll discuss.
Good morning. Good morning. My name is John Persinger and I'm a resident of Placer County. I'm here to comment regarding a pending claim against the county that I submitted on December 14th, 2023. That claim is up for decision in item 15A during this meeting. Per the agenda posted on the county website, county council has provided legal counsel and a recommendation to deny my claim. The office of Platter, Placer County Council is directly implicated in multiple criminal acts within my claim against the county. These criminal allegations are supported by straightforward physical evidence. Therefore, it is a direct conflict of interest and a clear violation of ethical conduct for county council to provide legal counsel or services regarding my claim. I know from research that at least one member of this board is a licensed attorney with the California State Bar. I call on you to provide guidance and ethical consideration to the following. Voting to deny my claim without consulting independent third party counsel would be a public endorsement of county council's criminal behavior and their clear violations of ethical guidelines set by the California State Bar. In addition, I have also submitted to county council a summary of allegations and proposed global settlement agreement. On January 3rd, 2024, I spoke with county council attorney Gregory Warner. Warner informed me that my proposed global settlement agreement has not and will not be presented to the board. I would like the board to be aware that my global settlement offer and summary of allegations document exists and I'm open to pre-litigation discussion. It is highly problematic that the Office of County Council continues to be involved with or render legal opinions in any matter involving me when I have in my possession physical evidence of their criminal behavior. This continued unethical conduct strengthens my claims of their criminal and professional malfeasance. I appreciate the board's attention. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I might respond. Yes. First of all, the item that's pulled is 15A number eight. Um, to respond to this, County Council does not have a conflict of interest, nor am I going to discuss pending litigation or the pending criminal charges against Mr. Persinger in public comment. If we have a conflict in the future, we clearly would bring that to the board. We do not now. In terms of the global settlement, that global settlement included uh, waiving all criminal charges, which clearly we're not going to take up. The DA is in charge of that particular item. I have nothing further to say. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Okay, is there any other comment by the board? Oh, do we take public comment? Anyone from the from the um, public like to make a comment regarding this? Do we have anyone online? Okay, so I need to bring it back to the board for a recommendation and motion to what to do on 15A. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair, I will move um, forward to make a motion to approve item 15A. I, I second that. Okay. All of those, do we do roll call? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstain? Hearing none, the motion passes. Okay, now we're moving on to the next item, which is 19, 19A. Let's see. It's a new gizmo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're on, great. All right. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. Dave Ackes, Senior Assistant Director of Emergency Services. I uh, wanted to just give you a brief presentation on item 19A, which is a you're asking for your board's approval to apply for a grant. Um, but wanted to talk a little bit about the project that that grant would support. And that is what's called the creation of a community wildfire protection plan. The last community wildfire protection plan that the county undertook was back in 2012. At that time, that grant, or excuse me, that plan only covered the areas that we had fire safe councils for. And of course, as Chair Holmes knows back then, uh, we only had a handful of them. It was Lincoln, the uh, greater Auburn area, which includes actually more than it does now. And then the Placer Sierra Fire Safe Council, which is essentially the I-80 corridor. And that's, and that's it. Um, also back uh, just before COVID, uh, actually my predecessor started a project to update that plan. Uh, that work of course got suspended like so much other work unfortunately due to COVID. In between then, it became clear that because that plan only took into account snippets of the county and the fact that there were other plans in the county, Olympic Valley, North Star, Tahoe RCD is now working on a community wildfire protection plan. It became clear 
Um, as we looked at all of these other plans, we have our local hazard mitigation plan, we have our sustainability plan, we have a safety element. It became clear that we really need to do a countywide plan that aligns all of that work under one umbrella, takes into account that our regional forest health coordinator work is doing, and so we wanna take a, just a little step back, do a plan that encompasses the entire county, make sure that all of that work can be eligible for grants as per, um, opportunities that become available. And of course, we of course are always looking for grant funding as a way to get that work done. And so we've already applied for a grant through the US Forest Service, although I think our chances there fortunately are not great because uh, Placer doesn't stack up against some of the other counties as far as disadvantaged communities. And so uh, we wanted to take advantage of this CAL FIRE grant opportunity to get that work done. So we're essentially seeking your board's permission to apply for that grant. And I will read the action item into the record. So asking for adopt a resolution authorizing the Assistant Director of Emergency Services or designee to apply for up to a $500,000 grant from, from the 2023-24 California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection CAL FIRE Climate Investments Wildfire Prevention Grants Program to develop a countywide community wildfire protection plan and authorize the Assistant Director of Emergency Services or designee to ex execute any required documents or amendments necessary to accept the funding and complete the project subject to county council and risk management concurrence. And then number two, determine that the action requested is exempt from environmental review pursuant to CEQA. <coughs> Guidelines section 51306. Whew. Okay. Uh, with all that, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or I can provide you some more detail if you'd like. Okay, thank you. My board members, do you have uh, questions or yes. comments? Um, I pulled the item, Dave, um, because I did want that explanation of what is different because I know some of our fire safe councils have been waiting the completion of the previous effort of the CWPP to apply for grant funding and they, we need a CWPP in place for them to apply and because we because of COVID, a number of reasons, we didn't complete that one. And so I've answered a lot of questions on that. I really appreciate the comprehensive approach. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Yes. But the state budget comes out tomorrow with a some multi-billion dollar deficit, whether it's 68 or 72 or who knows by tomorrow. Um, and so I'm concerned that we get this work done so we can continue to apply. So. For the board members, if we don't, if we're not successful or if CAL FIRE doesn't fund this, we may be needing to show our support to our communities that we can get these plans done. And I just wanted to alert you as well as Dave. I appreciated the explanation and I'm um, happy to make a motion after public comment on it. <laughs> okay, anyone else on the board? Uh, just one quick question. You may have mentioned this and maybe I missed it. Is it a matching grant or? Uh, actually this one, there is no match. Okay. Um, so one of the few out there these okay. days that actually uh, comes with no matching requirements. So. Great, thanks. Okay, any other comments by the board? Do we have any comments? Anyone from the public like to comment? Good morning, Michael. <clears throat> Michael Garabedian, uh, thank you for pulling this item for discussion. I think it's really important. And as far as I know, based on my experience, everything in this is, that's in this proposal is good and should be supported. Now, what I expect is not in it is, is the, dealing with the fact that Placer County has the highest concentration of wildland urban interface of every county in this state, and not including San Francisco, of course. Now, the thing is, you need a plan. You have to recognize, you should be recognizing in this that not creating more wildland urban interface is a goal. What that does is it put, putting people, whether it's ADUs or subdivision, minor divisions of minor divisions, you are putting people in harm's way and you are increasing the cost of fire, con fire prevention and fire control by putting more people out there. Something has to be done. This board itself has contributed to dividing up the county in, the, in inappropriate places for development or should not go on steep bridges and that kind of thing. So 
I suggest to you that you might have a better chance with this program if you specifically address what to do about the wildland urban interface and how to stop people, put, putting people in harm's way, whether it's kids uh, home from school on the bus or senior people uh, who can't get a ride out for evacuation. All these things we need the plans for, we need to do, I'm sure, what's in this program, but it's not enough and you, until you buckle down and deal with the problem that every, almost every, many actions of the planning and yourselves here put more people in harm's way and expand the wildland urban interface. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else from the public like to make a comment? Would, would you like to please come forward? I have just, <laughs> Sarah Rose, Ted, and Sarah Rose. I, I live in Rockland, and I've just become aware of the U. United Nations um, this is World Heritage um, Land Project. Ex excuse me. And is this item on the agenda today? Um, you know, you'll have to forgive me. I got a late phone call last night, and I'm, I haven't even had my first cup of coffee yet. Okay. I, I haven't even looked to see if it's on the agenda. I have a missing family member, um, but I um, didn't want to miss this. Um, no, I'll call you up. We're just addressing this this I item. Think this, I think what I'm oh. asking uh -huh. is, is any of the funding affiliated with the um, the United Nations World Heritage um, uh, Land Projects? Because if it is, there's some nefarious things behind it. And I'm I'm a very cynical person right now because. Our country's being overthrown, and any any federal grants that come in to our county need to be dissected, mm -hmm. and you need to know where the funding is coming from, because there is a long-term um, land theft going on in our county, and like you mentioned, we are rich in natural resources of, and water, um, and I don't want them given away to unelected officials who are claiming to be the... Um, the uh, stewards of our lands. These lands are our lands. And so I would like more information on this. I can't really make a comment because I don't know who is backing this funding and if it, if it is connected with the United Nations World um, Heritage Land Projects. If it is, it's, it's very nefarious and very dangerous. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Okay, are there any other uh, public comments. Anyone from online? Okay. All right, David. So can you... Did you want me to respond? Could you please? Sure. Um, so the funding for this comes from CAL FIRE, which is obviously a state agency. Uh, it's funded as part of their climate action program. Um, essentially, it's um, carbon trading credits, I believe, is most of where the funding of this comes from. Um, and we've used that for, for uh, several grants and Hopefully, we'll continue to have that opportunity. So. Okay, thank you. Um, given that, I'm happy to make a motion to approve this item. Okay. And I'll second it. All right. Um, all those in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you for thank your support. You, Dave. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's go back now to the public comment. So persons may address the board on items that are not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is only 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. Okay, so members, please come forward. Good morning, um, Jennifer Placer County. Uh, just gonna start with my quote. Um, a false conclusion once arrived at and widely accepted is not easily dislodged, and the less it is understood, the more tenaciously it is held. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I'm really excited about the new year. Um, I do wanna caution about a lot of censorship that's happening. Um, all over the internet, um, you know, we have the war we have everything at our fingertips, but for some reason it's all being blocked. And as we're going through and updating our countywide plan, 
and we're doing all this high density housing, um, we have to keep in mind about other opinions about green, green things, green carbon credits and stuff, electric cars. Uh, electric cars are, when you're charging them, and I'm still trying to understand the kilowatt hour behind it, because I'm not trained in that, but I am trying to learn that. But on these mega charging um, devices for the cars, it's using the same amount of energy when it's at full capacity, the, the charger, as over 200 households an hour. Um, and if it's at half capacity, it's about like 100 and I think 80 or 60. I, I left my paper at home with my notes, so I apologize. And I'm just curious how our electric grid here in Placer County is going to handle these types of things because as we create new um, updates to be green and get these credits and funding and stuff, are we gonna be putting ourselves at a deficit for um, us being having enough power? And um, we have to start looking at that. We have to also look at how these um, batteries are mined. It's very, um, very bad for the environment. And it cost, I think, around $17 a gallon for if you're converting it for gas to electric. And I, I don't know if that's really affordable in the long run. I know you get more miles on it and, and such, but um, we, I don't think we're looking at some of these little details. And as we're updating the plan to do all this green stuff, I'm sure there's a lot of other things that we're not really paying attention to because we're on the train, because we're looking for the funding and such to, to back some of this stuff so we can be strong, because Placer County is so strong. And I really love living here, it's a great county, so I just hope we can like look at some of these things and make sure that we're not putting ourselves into other deficits that we aren't paying attention to because we're not, things are being censored and we're not really going deep enough down to look at all the information for what it is. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other comments? Anyone who'd like to make comments, please come if you would, just line up in the center there and then, and then uh, and be ready. Okay, come on. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Pete Davison. I live on Florence Lane. And you're going to probably not be surprised by what I would like to talk about. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep this brief and on topic. We are learning a lot. I attended my first meeting on November 27th and wasn't quite sure really what the, what the target was and how this process worked. We're learning. Uh, we started a group after that November 27th meeting on Facebook, and we now have 97 members. <laughs> a portion of them, uh, three or four called in sick today. I know my wife's had a meeting with you. I used to live in your district uh, for 20 years. Um, we have a real issue with this rezoning process as a whole. Uh, Supervisor Holmes, you brought up on November 27th that three of the properties on option one needed to be removed. And the planning director seemed to said, no, we're, we can't do that right now. We were led to believe that we were going to be talking about that in January. I don't know when the agenda is going to allow this to happen but we heard about this drop dead date <clears throat> in May, that we have to have this done. You told us we had to have this done or the state's coming down on us. Here they come. Those three properties were Penryn, Blitz Lane, and Florence, where we live. So still don't have any signs. We just went and visited some of these properties. We've been talking with some of the supervisor's offices, and we found out that they really have not physically seen some of these properties. Yet you're getting ready to land a 260 unit right down the street from where we live, having not seen what this street looks like, what the services would be. You might be able to buy land up here cheaply, but by the time you invest in getting all of the structure ready to build on it, it's probably not gonna be so cheap. It also appears to me that an environment has been created that's kind of 
made a civil war out of county residents. We don't have any of these option one residents or, or these properties in Roseville, Rockland, or Lincoln. 53% of the choices on the option one plan are in two areas, North Auburn and Dry Creek. That's Bell Road up to the county line there on Bell, Bell and, or, uh, 49 and Bear River. So it seems like we're turning the county seat into maybe a toilet seat. <laughs> and it seems like we're taking a septic tank of these two areas here and making a leach line out to the county line. Can, can, you, can you sum up your comments because your time's expired. We expect what Mr. Holmes brought up in November 27th at the very least. Those three properties, let's bring that back up. I would hope that, you know, in reasonable fair play, we would have three supervisors who would be, two others who would be in agreement to vote those off at the very least. I think the whole process really needs to be re-looked at from the beginning, but let's start there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Wendy Farshman. Good morning, Wendy. I'm glad to start this new year getting to know you, my Placer County Board of Supervisors. I've lived in Placer almost 30 years. In that time, I earned a master's degree at Sac State. I raised five children with my husband, David, and I worked 13 years as a teacher's aide at my children's school. Now, I am a homemaker and a part-time babysitter for two of my three young grandchildren. I praise Jesus for his goodness to me and my family. Since November of 2020, I have researched national election irregularities, and I have studied election security here in Placer County. I have met with Ryan Ronco to express my concerns and to gain an overview of our county's elections procedures. I was an election observer in Placer for the last three major elections. From my research and experience, I know that our current state mandated election model is impossible for citizens to observe adequately. Our elections are not auditable nor certifiable. We, the citizens, are at the mercy of well-funded bad actors who are ruthless in lawfare and willing to threaten and commit harm to cement their power. This public comment period is not the venue to show how elections are manipulated on a national, state, and local level. But in the weeks to come, I do plan to meet with each of you to present my pressing concerns. I hope to learn whether your concerns mirror my own. I wish to know if you are committed to upholding the civil rights of your constituents. Here are some questions I plan to ask you. How can you, as county supervisors, encourage and support Shasta County in its decision to go back to hand counting of ballots? Do you believe that our registrar of voters can make his decision to certify the outcome of an election solely from the data available to him, free from fear and coercion from the state? If our registrar of voters discovered that fraud determined the outcome of an election, would you support his decision to refuse certification? How would you, as county supervisors, support his position? I thank you all for your attention, and I pray that God gives you integrity and courage in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm um, next. <laughs> I just need okay. to speak. I think it'll be you. <laughs> um, my name's Leslie Davison, and Pete is my husband. And just for clarification here. Um, so as he stated, we live on Florence, off of Florence Lane. And we've been up here before, and we've talked about this. And I don't mean to be rude, but I, I don't understand how you can vote on something that you haven't seen, that you aren't even aware of. There are so many sites that need to be looked at there, the ones that we have seen, there are no signs. Okay, that's the first thing. The second one is the traffic on 49. If you see where these sites are, 
Supervisor Cindy, you you drive up to Grass Valley, you know what the traffic is. Okay, so if you put Florence Lane, uh, Elders Corner, um, across from Jager Road, and on down the line, the traffic is going to be nonstop or bumper to bumper. And I heard, and I don't know if this is true, there's going to be a roundabout at Florence Lane. I mean. My head is blowing off. Are you kidding me? What is a roundabout going to do? It's going to roundabout the same traffic that's going straight ahead. It's not going to do anything. It, it's going to cost a fortune. Um, I just, I, you know, I, I head slap. I, the emojis are just, I mean, it's crazy. The other thing is fire and uh, police. Are we adequately um, served at this point, and will we? My husband and I had to call the fire department on Saturday. We had th three trucks show up. It, we, it was fine, but um, afterwards I asked them, are you guys aware of the housing going in and what's happening? No. Mm -mm. One firehouse had two in the firehouse, two. I felt kind of bad bringing them to my house because nothing, you know, everything was fine. So can you imagine those two are gone where, where if somebody had a real fire, where would they come from? Where, how would they put out a fire? I'm just, I'm just kind of, I'm speechless if that's how it sounds. Going into Christian Valley, let me just point out another thing. You've got Florence Lane, Dry Creek, and the on-ramp up there at 80, right? Going into Christian Valley. Okay, so you've got 260 units at Florence Lane. You've got how many at Dry Creek? How are EMS and um, the police supposed to get in there if you've, if you've got a whole lot of people, a whole lot of cars going in? What do you guys, I mean, you guys live there. What do you think? If you're in Christian Valley, are you kind of concerned that you're not gonna get the police in there or the fire department in there? Yes, can you sum up I your- I mean, these are the people that live there and now, they need to be aware of what's going on here. Okay. So, you know, three minutes, that's, that's not even enough. Thank you for your comments. Good morning. Good, Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Nice to see you again. Good morning. You know, I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm just a rancher and can a you, farmer. Can you state your name for the record? Oh, my name's Penny Cooey. I'm the owner of Long Run Ranch in Newcastle. I've been in business 10 years. Um, we, build, we build shelters for animals that... A couple of quick things. Uh -huh. I always I sit here and wonder, and I look at all you, and I wonder how many of you have land, how many of you have ranches, how many of you have livestock that you care for at 4 o'clock in the morning like most of us do that ranch here and farm here. Um, I, my guess is that most of you do not. Um, I guess that most of you don't live in the areas that are being proposed to have mass housing. That would be my guess. You don't live there, so it doesn't affect you. But you make major decisions that affect us. It isn't affecting my ranch now. But happen in a year or two, you decide, well, we need to put mass housing down on Gold Hill Road in Newcastle. What's to stop you? Nothing. Because we come here, we take time off work, we take time off our land, we take time from our family to come here to speak to you and do our words just go on deaf ears? Do you just look at us and think we're all idiots and that you're going to do whatever you want anyway? You are supposed to represent us. This man got me through many years when my son was in Iraq. This man has a heart of gold. And... This community held me when my boy was in imminent danger and I couldn't get a hold of him for two weeks. We love it here. The violence in Auburn is out of control. My daughter works at Dodge. She, I have to have her text me every single night when she gets in her car so that I know she's safe. And she's a heavy lifter. You think I'm big? You ought to see her. Um, the other thing is I just read about your manure ordinance. 4.6 acres. If you have under 4.6 acres, you cannot 
compost your horse manure. Only horses, nothing about cattle, goats, sheep, pigs, anything else, just horses. So if you have 4.7 acres, you can, point, can compost. These people want to have horses on their land. It's kind of like you guys are trying to push these horse owners from not having horses anymore because an expense to have manure removed. And then where's it going? To the landfill? So you don't want them to compost at home, have worms, make fertilizer, fertilize their own land, fertilize their gardens, grow their own vegetables, be self-sustaining. You would rather have them pay money to someone who's running gas and big trucks in their neighborhood, haul it to the landfill so it goes for what? You don't want people to be self-sustaining and grow their own food? I just read about your ordinance. It's out of control. 4.6 acres, you have to have your manure hauled off within seven days. Not only that, but it can't sit on the ground for more than 48 hours. What is this? Why don't you guys really think about what you're doing and represent us? Not Newsom, not anybody else, but us and the diversity of the people that live here and want to thrive here. I too do daycare for my granddaughters. I'm blessed. I get to work from my ranch. It's growing. I care for my grandchildren every single day. Ma'am, so, can you sum up yes. your comments? You know what I want to say? You need to hear us. You need to hear our, you haven't been out to the site? That is horrendous. Well, How I, do you make a decision on something that you haven't seen? If you, wanna, if you want us to hear you, you really put it in writing as well. And so we can know I have all of it, your thoughts. I have put it in writing. I feel that it goes on deaf ears because yeah. us ranchers and farmers are being pushed out. Where are you guys, wh what's gonna happen? We're gonna be like Roseville? No. Auburn needs to be like Roseville when my own Thank daughter you. can't walk to her car without fear of her mother being, of her right. daughter being mugged at night. Thank you for your comments. We, we will be, we will be taking into consideration. One more thing I want to add. Make it very clear. My chiropractor in Auburn had to move his office from Nevada Street because his staff did not feel safe after 18 years working there. Okay. We'll take a note. We'll Maybe we should worry about that. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> so Sarah Rose again in Rockland, and my public comment is relating to all of these good people who are, are farmers and, and uh, ranchers because no farms, no food. And mm -hmm. I'm getting tired of people coming up to me and telling me the globalist agenda does not um, exist. The United Nations Agenda 21 has been around for a long time. Agenda 2030 is addressing you. Uh, if you look at the United, here again, the United Nations, this fascist entity that we pay billions to every year, is they're, they're gonna rape our land. And the United Nations um, 30 by 30 Act, that means zero carbon by 2030. We're running out of time, and that addresses your thing with the manure. So we've all been psyoped. I'm not gonna sit up here and blame the county board because all of us have allowed an overreach of our government. And this is where tacticalcivics.com, tacticalcivics.com, it's a private foundation, it is not funded by the government. I am just learning about it now because with um, something that is in legislation right now in deceit, in DC is upsetting me because of what's happening to all of our landowners here and all of our public lands. And so I would highly recommend you go and listen to it. It is, I would, what I would like us here in Placer County is to be a leader and to establish an ordinance that gives us a citizen county grand jury. We are the enforcers. This land, public land, our private lands belong to us. It doesn't belong to our government. And we need to take back our country because we have allowed, we've, we've just been all psyoped, okay? And so we have till January 18th because it's all this look over here, look over here. You know, first they denied there was a border issue. Well, we have millions and millions of people coming over illegally to replace the voters that are moving out of the blue cities. And we, we are, um, we're gonna be replaced as, as uh, patriot Americans. And, and I guess that makes me a terrorist because I'm a patriot. But um, 
So I would highly recommend that you go to the uh, Security Exchange Commission and do your public comment. Um, uh, JBS.org has made it easy for you. But right now, here again, it goes back to the United Nations coming in and stealing our land and people like Bill Gates, the eugenicist, Microsoft Bill Gates, poisoning us with all these GMOs and feed, feed food for your animals. Um, but you need to um, put in your public comment and stop this proposed rule, and it's, it's called um, uh, Natural Assets uh, Companies, and they want to sell our land on the stock market, and it's SR-NYSE, um, New York Stock Exchange, dash 2023-09. And we need to stop it from passing because now the mainstream media liars, they have us looking over at the borders and they have us looking over at Biden and everything else. And they're going to pass, while, while we're distracted by all this other stuff, they're going to pass this and they're going to steal our land. And, and this smart city infrastructure that's going up. Sarah, can you wrap up your comments? I'm okay, sorry. I have done research. Explain. These LED lights, these, smart, these, these 5G towers, all this dense property. You go to c40.org. You look at all of the United uh, States uh, mayors that sold out their city to a smart city like San Francisco and LA and Chicago and Minnesota. And you're going to see a pattern. You can't build Rose, that better until you, you destroy something. You need to wrap up your comments. They're I'm sorry. They're, I know. Our nation, our nation is on a time limit to shut us up. Yeah. TacticalCivics.com. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Americans. Good morning. Good morning. Back on local <laughs> issues. <laughs> I'm Kelly Yates, and um, I, I'm, I'm also back on the Florence um, issue. I've lived in Christian Valley over 30 years now, and um, and I moved out there because it was beautiful. I moved from the Bay Area to get away from all the stuff that's happening now up in Auburn. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, also aside from the traffic issue on 49, which really is, I mean, it's a, it's a debacle, that whole 49 is. But um, affordable housing, if, if those people need to be by services, and there are no services in that area. Um, Roseville, Lincoln, that's really where they all are, and um, more jobs and everything, it would make more sense. Um, on the subject of affordable housing, I really would rather you guys focus on affordable housing for seniors. You know, 25% of Auburn is, is seniors, and uh, I'm, I'm a real estate broker, and there's a, a local builder that has built duplexes. He's advertising as affordable senior housing, and they're a thousand square feet for six hundred thousand. That's that's I don't know who that's affordable to, but you know. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out. We really don't have anywhere for seniors. We've built affordable apartments, you know, right down the street here, um, and I just don't think we need any more in the you know rural areas so that's it <laughs> thank you for your comments good morning board good morning uh the last time you guys saw me was uh in november or uh, october i think it was Sir, 31st can you, state, can you state your name for the record? hi my name is john davenport okay. this is kaya davenport <laughs> okay. um we're here against to, to, to talk about the tgi um homeless shelter especially to jim uh, Cindy and you folks that are on the board there, folks, we got a real issue with these people. These people are, we need somebody else in there. And if you guys aren't going to take action to that, then we're, we're going to do some other actions ourselves. This started off as a warming center and it's to, to get people off the streets. It was to, to keep people housing if they wanted some housing. All that is gone. TGI is doing what they want. They're going to make residential out of this place. We're not getting anybody new people in there. And after the last time you guys saw me, I've been targeted because I've been the voice for the homeless shelter, okay? I've been targeted. I lasted three days and got thrown out for 30 last time you saw me. I didn't speak up on that because I thought after my 30 days, I would be cool and lay it, lay it down. I got in six days. They threw me and my service dog, 13-year-old service dog, out again. I caught pneumonia the first 30 days. This girl has done search and rescues for Colfax Fire Department. This is a public servant right here, okay? They've got, I've had them change my knee surgeries out because of TGI, all because of their disciplinary actions, what they wanna do and what they accuse people of doing. I had my service dog lacerated by a dog in there 
and they would not tell me what was happening to this person. They gave this person 24 hours out. She got to sit on the, on the porch from 11 to 1, and that counted for her 24 hours. My service dog of 13 years, I haven't had to, have to worry about a leash inside because she's so old. Like, she can't follow me around everywhere I go. She's just too old. I ain't had an issue since. All of a sudden, I get thrown out for another 30 days for not having a leash on my dog while she's sleeping in a bed in the day room. While this lady who lacerates my dog, I don't even get to go and get to the vet. And my dog suffered from serious wounds on the shoulder and on the neck. While this gal got 24 hours out. We need a different, we need some kind of uh, disciplinary boundaries. One for TGI, to go in and see what they're doing wrong and to help them to help us. Okay, you guys don't understand that TGI is the only people here in the Placer County and we don't have another choice. So when they throw somebody out like me from their other shelter, then when we get into another well, shelter where I'm at now, I can't move forward. Other people can't move forward because it's still TGI doing the same dirty tricks. They lie. They, 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 they said that they gave me a verbal warning. There's no verbal warning. And then they just went and threw me out for 30 days for no leash on my service dog. Oh, come on, guys. I have the nicest, coolest service dog there is. Um, TGI is a dirty, foul company. And we're asking you guys, you three in particular, to please look into this a little bit more. I served, I've been nine days in that, there, 60 days out in this element with bad heart, needs to be replaced. I just had metal put in my neck. I am the most working and favorable person in that place doing what I can for the employees and for the clients. Anybody will tell you that. Even the, even the, oh, the, the, the employees will tell you, I'm a hard worker. I do all kinds of crazy good things for that place. And the clients will tell you that. Guys, we're having people thrown out and they, they just target people. <clears throat> this targeting is ridiculous. And we have a better key on this for the homeless population. And the public would appreciate it if you guys would come in and look into this as well. Because you're sending us out there, throwing us out without none of our belongings as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Board. Thanks, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Danielle Rossetti. I am a... Placer County resident for 20 years, grew up in California, love this state, sad to see what's happening to it. Um, my house is next to Florence um, property. I have six acres that have been a beautiful place to live when I moved there. Um, we've been there almost 18 years. And um, the wildlife in that area is is phenomenal. I don't know where your study came from that said there would be no environmental impact to wildlife because I don't know. <laughs> I get pictures of mountain lion in my front yard all the time. Um, I really would like to have Florence removed from that list. It is a beautiful area and it should be for um, single family homes that may be on an acre or two, not multiple housing not an apartment complex. I can't have an apartment complex next to my horse barn. Obviously, you guys, I found out now today that you're trying to get rid of horses in Placer County. I have, it's, I'm a volunteer for Placer Land Trust and I'd actually honestly thought about donating my land to, to them because of the wildlife. I mean, look at that land again. Look at that study, who did it? They need to really question that because I do not believe that it was a valid study. I appreciate your time. I hope you considered removing that land from the um, apartment complex, and I would like to conti continue seeing it as rural. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else in the audience? Please come forward. Good morning, board. My name is Tim McGuire. Um, I live in Meadow Vista. So I kind of want to start with uh, our relationship with you all uh, as the public and as you are representatives. Um, an adversarial relationship is not a good one. I, I, and I know these people don't want to have that with you all. Um, we want to feel like you are representing us and that our voices are heard and that you go to battle with, with our voices and our wishes um, as opposed to going into office and feeling like you need to 
follow Sacramento's demands. We are your employers. We, you are our trusted servants. I want to look at you that way. I, don't, I want to see the human faces. I've spoken with Cindy. Uh, I, I've, I've heard good things from you people. I know you're good people. I really believe that there comes a time when we need to draw a line and really look at what the community is, is telling you. Um, we really didn't feel like we, this, this felt like a blind side to a lot of us. Maybe you, uh, maybe you fulfilled your, your duties as far as notification on this process all along the way. But as something that is impactful as this, I feel like it should have been something that was very clearly uh, uh, advertised or, or given to us in a way that we understood it. Because as you see, it, it really feels like you didn't. Um, so as far as the, the properties involved in this, this uh, rezoning, um, without any infrastructure, um, it's, a, it's a nightmare. Not only fire, police, medical, schooling, traffic, all these major issues one at a time, put them all together, and it really is a nightmare. Then add in the environmental disaster. And, and I don't know, I didn't read that you guys came up with like, for instance, Florence was a non-environmental impact. Uh, if you ever have been through there and watched a deer run through that, that hillside and that valley there, um, coyotes, uh, you know, all sorts of wildlife up there. And it's beautiful to behold. And the flowers, the trees, I mean, it's, it's an impact. And it's an impact not just to us, to the environment, to the community and to the community of Auburn because all this is going to be funneling down into Auburn and make everything we already have that's bad worse. Um, you know, I spoke with you, Cindy, about uh, the potential of having uh, another way to create that, that number through uh, ADUs, and you researched it and you found out Napa County does that. So this is something that I, I really would like you guys to look at as far as a way we can create this number without decimating these areas. So right. anyway, thanks thank, a lot, guys. Thank you for your comments. Please come forward. This, this will be our last public comment from the audience because we have five people waiting online to comment as well. Thank you for, for waiting. My name is Teresa Powell, and I live off Florence Road on Helen Lane. Um, I'm concerned the 20 units on each acre would result in, if you had three people per unit, 780 additional people, five people per unit, as they say they're allowing, 1,300 people. Um, if you bump it up to 30 units per acre, it's uh, 1,170 people. If you go by three, five people, 1,950 people. If you put two cars per unit on the 20 units, you have 520 cars on that corner. For the 30 units, two cars, 780 cars on that corner. I don't know how you can accommodate this many people out there. There's no infrastructure. I know you're looking at increasing the infrastructure. I know you have to revisit this, according to what I've researched, every 10 years. So I think you'll be bumping the infrastructure out there, bumping it out there, until finally you got your infrastructure out there where you could do these units, like the one gal said, 600,000 per unit for this low-income housing. You're only allowed to put like 10% low-income there. So you're going to be making the bucks off the other people you put in. Um, it's just wrong. And I saw Megan Wood say when she saw us people congregating, she says, they're back. So I'm wondering, you did, you did. She said, <laughs> you did. And I've seen people rolling their eyes. I don't think you're taking us seriously. And I think when we show up, it's the eye roll and the comment like I heard you say, and you did. Um, I don't think we're being taken seriously, and I just, I've 
bought my property there in 1978. I was able to raise enough money to build come 1989. I've lived there since 1990 when the house was finished. They opened up Florence Road, got rid of all the potholes. The traffic on my road has already increased 20-fold since they opened up Florence. You put all those people on there, you want to see how many cars are on that road, how many people are recreating on our road, you're just going to destroy us. We came up there for a reason, and I just can't stand to see what you're doing to Auburn. It just makes me cringe. Thank you for your comments. Okay, let's... Um, you said that, Megan, you did. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Let's go to uh, the online, our online. Let's go to our online college. Lori, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, I'm Lori Brady. I live in Rose Hill. I'm a member of Placer People of Faith Together, and I'm also a member of Roseville Advocates for the Homeless. And my comment um, is about an exciting topic, I think. It's the Navigation Center. Um, we've heard a lot about this and we saw a presentation from Bonnie Gore, and both organizations are really excited about this opportunity. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about what's going on and where this is going to be and potentially how we might be able to help with the success of this organization or this property. So um, anyway, I'd like to uh, just express that we have a lot of folks out here really excited about the potential for this but not hearing a lot of detail. And another thing that I would also like to mention is that I am a volunteer at the Gathering Inn in Roseville. I work in their um, medical clinic and I've been doing this for several years, but I've noticed just recently with the restriction of access to the Gathering Inn, the services that are being offered there are very much impacted. Uh, we're seeing hardly anyone in our medical clinic, and we know there's a lot of people out there suffering and need our help. So I'd also like to mention that that's possibly something that needs to be looked at and uh, potentially corrected. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Wes, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Wes, are you unable to unmute your mic? iPhone caller, are you unable to unmute your mic and give your comments? No, I can unmute my mic. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, my name is Dave Daly. I live in Loomis. Been in Loomis since 98. Uh, I'm listening to the meeting online. I usually try to come to the meetings, but it's very hard to come there when you have them in the morning at your convenience and not everybody else's convenience. But if you listen to the meeting online like I am on Zoom, you guys can't wait to get these people off of that stage when they're done speaking. And they're not done speaking. You guys are supposed to be stewards of our society, not screwers of our society. And if you guys want to build another homeless shelter, why don't you go on Kathy Baxter's innocent, uh, incident page and see the hundreds and hundreds of homeless actions, illegal actions, walking around with machetes, looking in people's windows, and you want to bring more homeless to Auburn and build low-income housing? You call it affordable housing, but why don't you just be straight with the people? It's low-income housing. And I don't know where are these people coming from who are going to fill the low-income housing. Are you going to put in the a homeless? I think if you want to build low-income housing and you're actually serious, we have hundreds of veterans who are homeless and hundreds of elderly people and more elderly people to be very soon in Auburn, if you want to fulfill your obligation 
to build low-income housing. You should look to build low-income housing for the people that are there that are going to need it so you can keep them in Auburn. And I don't know why you want to put low-income housing in Penryn. For one, you can't put it anywhere 500 feet off of the freeway, okay? And you guys are bypassing that, and I don't know how, how you're bypassing that because that's the law. There's no services. And if you think that Loomis is going to absorb all of the services for all these people that you want to shove down our throats and take away our land, because that's what they want to do in Loomis. Everybody in that room that owns land, they think that we don't deserve to own land no more. How could one person own land and hog all that land when we have all these homeless people looking for somewhere to live? Well, you know what? That ain't my problem. When I bought my house in, in 98, it was 868 square feet. I've added on since then. It's a much bigger house now. It's the point that you're putting all these homeless issues and all this low income issues without taking into consideration the people that elected you, the people that are paying taxes, what if everybody stopped paying taxes and you had no money no more okay and all and if and the people that are in there they had to put it on their general plan to build low-income housing they have eight years to do it i don't know why you're in such a rush thank you very much for your time thank you for your comments cheryl please unmute your mic and give your comments Hi, good morning. Um, congratulations, Supervisor Jones, on your um, chair position. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about the rezones also. Um, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the wording being used to couch this initiative. The state is mandating it is really kind of a slick play on words. The state actually is enforcing the obligations that Placer County had when they signed up for um, the number of units that they would have for very low, low, um, moderate, and above. And so not meeting your obligation is not the same as the state mandating you to meet your obligation. So to state like it's a brand new topic, it's not. It's over 10 years in the making. Once again, Bonnie Gore, Jim Holmes, Cindy Gustafson, ex-supervisor Wagant and ex-supervisor Euler, you failed your job performance and you failed to meet that obligation. Now, with Sunset Area Plan, you knew in 2017 that you were not going to make that obligation. You failed to self-correct, and now you are trying to transfer that obligation to rural unincorporated residents. Developers currently on the active project list, there are multiple specific plans looking for more variances, amendments, and so on. They need to fulfill their obligations. We should not be putting with no infrastructure, we're giving them money for infrastructure and having rural unincorporated residents take the burden. This is like a shell game. It should not be happening. And it's it's happening at the last minute, no signage. It was posted in the Sacramento Bee. People live where Gold Country Media, you seem to be able to put all your articles in there, all your commentaries, but you don't have you don't have the courtesy to post signs and advertise in, a, in an unpaid publication where people can look at it. I think that um, to look at those numbers, state the, the properties that Placer owns and the specific plans should be the first places that you look because those were the beneficiaries of the, the poor performance that we had in the previous unit. I would also like to state that when you look at performance, um, Jim Holmes and Cindy Gustafson are up for election. Look at their performance for the next time around. I hope you will look at that because to make people that have saved for 25, 30, 40 years give up their properties and have high rises next to them is not the correct answer. Thank you and Happy New Year. Thank you. For your Diane, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. 
Okay, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Uh, Diane Louise Alessi, I am, as of 2024, the Vice Chair for Christian Valley Park Community Services District. You've heard from me before a couple of occasions on both rezoning projects, the airport rezone uh, project and this high density rezoning project. I've made it clear to the board that our board of super uh, directors are vehemently against site 58, which is the Florence Road connection, which the planners have in parentheses that an annexation would be required <coughs> from Christian Valley Park in order for the water infrastructure to go there. I've mentioned before, and I will do that for the public, that even to consolidate with Placer County Water Agency, our board has an, and is in negotiation to see if that is viable, but they want between 20 and 30,000 per connection. Who's gonna pay for that if there's 200 or 300 units put on Florence? Furthermore, our infrastructure is aged. I personally have been in Christian Valley for 58 years. My folks bought this property in 1966. It was horse friendly, one acre minimums. It's meant to be rural, agricultural, and unincorporated. And it infringes on Christian Valley Park's sovereignty. Our roads, anybody doesn't want to do 49 and all the pressure on it, it's gonna go down Florence and bust through, down through Christian Valley. Not to mention it is just disproportionate. As you all know, North Auburn is getting hit. My comment is, is that at some point, we have to reclaim our sovereignty and tell us the state, corporate state, not the judicial state, that they need to back up their train. This is not a globalist agenda up here and infrastructure is going to go to the taxpayers and you're gonna be <laughs> approached by all the developers, subsidize, subsidize, subsidize. When you do low income housing, those are subsidized. Grants that you are getting for Placer County is subsidized by the taxpayers of the state of California, in particular for infrastructure. We are going to get the burden. So what you are going to get sanctioned for by the state is a pittance compared to the residents and owners in Northern California for all of this. And what it is, is it's really a lot to do with Prop 13 too. And I will just say, older people that have done legacy uh, pass downs to their property are in a very low property tax rate. So the more pressure you put on people and elderly, they're gonna sell and then Placer County gets a new tax rate basis for that property. I'm one of those. I know that's fact, that's not brain, you know, that doesn't take rocket science to figure out. So pushing people that have been entrenched in this area for a very long time and have benefited from the lower taxes are getting so much pressure put upon them via the government and the corporations that it's, it's the shell game, as, as was stated before. Furthermore, the illegal aliens that are being bussed in are getting $2,200 a month, the average um, senior is getting a social security of about 1400 a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying push back, stop the nonsense, take the sanction, and then publicly put it out there so people can put in writing and petition, no more, we're done. Stop it. Our board is meeting tonight. Anybody can join publicly on Zoom. We have it on our agenda. You will be getting our objection letter and anybody else in Christian Valley. There is a huge groundswell to stop it. Yeah. And as elected officials, as I am one, we have to listen to our constituents. With that, I yield and hope we have a better new year. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Sandy, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, 
Sandy, are you unable I'm to? Sorry, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Sandy, we can hear you. Hello? She can't hear us. Hello, can you hear me? Sandy, we're able to hear you. Can you hear us? Hello? <laughs> Ask her if she's muted. She, no, she was not. She was off of mute. Wes, are you able to unmute your mic? I believe so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Wes Moody. I'm a volunteer with Tahoe Nordic Search and Rescue. Uh, approved on today's agenda as a consent item was a $2,000 revenue sharing donation toward the Great Ski Race, which is Tahoe Nordic Search and Rescue's primary fundraiser. As you know, our team was founded in 1976 by several Tahoe residents, including Larry Sevenson. Larry went on to be elected a Placer County Supervisor, and in that capacity and several others served Placer County and the Lake Tahoe community for many years. Since our formation in 1976, we have conducted 425 searches and located more than 700 individuals. Last year alone, we participated in 20 searches and devoted several thousand hours of training of our team. Nearly all of our training is conducted by team members, so there was no cost to the team. Today's contribution by the Board of Supervisors is part of what keeps our team trained, equipped, and ready to conduct search searches and save lives. I want to personally thank Supervisor Gustafson and all the supervisors for today's approval of the revenue sharing on the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Sandy, we'll give this one more try. Are you able to unmute your mic and give your comments? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I am so sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is Sandy from Placer County. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, and uh, congratulations to Suzanne Jones for becoming our new chair. And thank you so much, Supervisor Holmes, uh, for all the work that you did uh, this last year. Um, don't have a lot for you this morning other than just reading a couple of uh, um, parts of the California State Constitution. Um, just to kind of back up the, all the, uh, the comments of your constituents. Um, Article 1, Section 26 says, the provisions of this Constitution are mandatory and prohibitory unless by express words they are declared to be otherwise. And then another one is from uh, Article 1, Section 28 of our California Constitution. Um, oh, is that it? Yeah. All students and staff of public primary, elementary, junior high, and senior high schools and community colleges, colleges and universities have the inalienable right to attend campuses which are safe, secure, and peaceful. Unalienable rights are the inherent sovereign natural rights that existed before the creation of government and which being antecedent to and above the constitutions of the states and federal government can never be taken away diminished, altered, or leaned upon by the state subject only to the due process of the common law. Nor can any unalienable right be fundamentally removed, whether mistakenly by contract through coercion or non-disclosure, which is fraud and unenforceable in law, or knowingly by renunciation, which is contrary to natural law or God's law. Liberty is the intersection of freedom and morality. And I've got a couple of rights uh, listed here, but I'm going to go ahead and save that for another time and just give you that opportunity to kind of take that in and see how you can incorporate it into the manner in which uh, business is conducted. So thank you so much. I'm praying for you guys all. Uh, let's have a great year, 2024. Yay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Chair, there are no further public comments. Okay. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming today and for making your comments to us. Please, please write the board members, send to the to the board clerk, and um, make sure she'll make sure we all get copies of those written comments, if you would. Madam Chair, can I yes. just ask a question of our acting CEO? 
Um, we had committed to the community. We had asked the staff to bring this back, this topic of the rezone to a future meeting. Do we have that mm -hmm. scheduled yet? Uh, Supervisor Gustafson, yes. Well, it's tentatively scheduled for February 20th, uh, special board meeting. And that will be a workshop update and workshop and so if people sign up on the website they will get this information they'll know that that is another workshop we still won't be voting at that point is that correct that's correct mm -hmm. okay okay so if I just want to make sure the public is well aware of the process okay so please put it on your calendars and come back and uh, participate in that workshop February 20th well, our board meeting will start at 9 a.m. as usual, and public comment is usually very close after 9, 9.05, 9. It'll be different for the... Oh, for the work? Here or on Civic Center Drive? That's a good question. At, at this point in time, we can't answer the location. It will be here or at our Community Development Resource Agency. Given the public interest, we will most likely hold it at the agency as it has a larger capacity for public attendance. The meeting is scheduled currently to start at 9. Public comment for the item will not occur until after staff gives their presentation and the board is, has a chance to ask their questions. At that time, public comment will occur. If you send any comment letters to boardclerk at placer.ca.gov, those will be included in the administrative record of that meeting. Yes, there is a, a way to sign up on our website to receive agenda updates. Okay, thank you for coming. Okay, so um, board members, uh, board member reports or, um, yes. I had a, a quick one um, for the board too, actually. Again, I wanna thank, I know I was the last of the supervisors to get to do the sheriff's department tour and uh, I wanted to thank the sheriff's office uh, and especially Sheriff Wu for re um, engaging in those tours I thought it was extremely extremely informative um, to see the passion commitment dedication of our sheriff's departments men and women who serve and protect this county is is overwhelming so I want to thank Sheriff Wu and all of the leadership for making that happen it was a big time commitment for you all as well as for us um, and then secondly, I just wanted to share with the board um, that I did send one more letter. We'll try again with Commissioner Lara. Um, I had received numerous, numerous um, complaints about the delays in uh, customer service for the um, Cal Fair plan. Not only is it hugely expensive, no, you know, and people are losing their insurance and droves and companies are leaving. But then people are on hold for four, six hours. I had an insurance broker tell me it's usually two to three hours for an insurance broker to get a simple um, answer to a question. And we have had escrows fall through from young families trying to buy properties that can't get insurance, or they get an insurance bill for the entire year um, that is uh, above $10,000 and they can't buy the home and come up with the down payment and make that all in one time instead of going monthly on those like many do when they're first starting out. So just wanted to let you know we've sent another letter. We'll keep our fingers crossed that we do get a response and that, um, that they take some action to do more expedient uh, customer service. Thanks. Thank you for that. Bonnie. Uh, just one thing, um, in addition to what Supervisor Gustafson mentioned about um, the visit with the Sheriff's Office and all of our facilities, today is actual, actually National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. So we have a couple of our law enforcement here in the room. Get and back out. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to just acknowledge just the great work that our county law enforcement does, as well as the law enforcement um, in our local police departments as well. We are very fortunate in Plaster County to not only have great law enforcement, but residents who support our law enforcement. Um, and it allows them to do their jobs effectively because they're supported by our residents. So just wanted to make a sh give a shout out to our law, law enforcement. And thank you for that. Any other? Um, no, CEO, do you have a report for us today? Sure. No, okay, well then we're gonna move on to our 9.30 item. Um, a Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement Award. Um, 
we will acknowledge and present Andrew C. Sisk, uh, Placer County Auditor Controller, with the Certificate of Achievement Award for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the annual comprehensive financial report of the fiscal year ending that ended June 30, 2022. So there is a press release that I would like to read. It says, Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada has awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the County of Placer for its annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year that ended June 30, 2022. The report has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which includes demonstrating a constructive spirit of full disclosure to clearly communicate its financial story and motivate potential users and user groups to read the report. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a very significant accomplishment by a government and its management. So did we get the award to present to? All right, we have an award to present to you, Andy. Good morning, members of the board. Good morning. Daniel Karen. Yes. Uh, it, needless to say, I, I'm very proud of this accomplishment, especially since I've been intimately involved in all 22 years of the county receiving this award. But it doesn't go without saying it's collaborative countywide team effort that puts these financial statements together. I can thank the Public Works Department, Facilities Management, formerly Facility Services, the County Council's Office. Uh, leading up to the day of the issuance of the opinion, we're asking for information to update our footnote disclosures up to the leading of the issuance of the financial statements. Uh, one of those footnote disclosures, uh, the cash and investments disclosure. Special thanks to Tristan and his team. Uh, we require a lot of information from their office. I think we can thank Orange County for going bankrupt in 1994 for all the additional standards that followed uh, that bankruptcy, uh, so they know firsthand. Thank you to the board and the county executive office for your leadership, especially those that serve on the audit committee. Uh, but I want to give special thanks to my financial reporting team. I, I have a dynamic duo in the office, and when I say dynamic duo, usually it's my property tax division. But now I have a dynamic duo in the financial reporting division, and that is Debbie Chan and Emily McLean, who are here with me as well. Uh, they have elevated the level of professionalism in our office. Uh, they have taken the lead on implementing these new standards. When we, issue, when we received the award 20-something years ago, we were at Gatsby Statement number 33, and now we're at issuance 102. Uh, so there's 70 standards that have had to be implemented. They work collaboratively with the departments to make sure that we can implement these standards effectively. Uh, when I was auditing the county uh, in 2001, I was the audit manager, and it was then the auditor controller, Catherine Martinez, that said, we need to elevate our financial statements to make them what they are. Uh, Debbie Chan, who worked with me, was my senior accountant. I was the audit manager, uh, and Debbie worked with me to get the county their first award in 2001. Uh, so again, we're very proud of this accomplishment and thank you very much for this uh, presentation and honor. Congratulations again. Move on to the 945 item, Public Works, uh, Baseline Commercial Center, Annexation for Sewer Services. Presenting today, 
There we are. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Sarah Gilmer here with Environmental Engineering. And I just wanted to introduce Huey Nam, our senior engineer in front of uh, land development. Nice to meet you, Huey. Uh, good morning, Chair Jones and board members. My name is Huey Nam, and I'm here on behalf of the Environmental Engineering Division to present the annexation of Baseline Commercial Center. As stated in the board memo, we are requesting the board open a public hearing to adopt the resolution, which is included in the staff report, to annex the property located south of Baseline Road, east of Willega Road in West Placer, on assessor parcel number 023-221-082000, into the boundaries of County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 173, Dry Creek. The Baseline Commercial Center contains approximately 37 proposed EDUs. If approved, the project is required to pay annexation fee based on rates containing the amended reimbursement agreement with the Dry Creek West Placer Community Facility District Number 1. The total fee would be $101,042.36. County will disperse those funds as required in that agreement. Staff supports this request. In order to move forward, we request that your board conduct a public hearing and adopt the resolution in the staff report to annex the property into the boundaries of County Service Area 28, Zone Benefit 173, Dry Creek. If there's any questions, I would be happy to address them. Thank you for that. So, um, I, we have to have a public hearing on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll open a public hearing. Does anyone from the public like to have, ask questions or comment? Uh, Mike Arabedian, I think that a map would be uh, helpful for everybody to see. Staff report. It's in the back of the staff report. Yeah. Okay. So it's in the back of the staff report on page seven, but I'm not sure if you have access to that. Is there any other comments from the public on this item? Is there anyone online? Not online, Chair. Okay. Well, then I close close this public hearing then, and bring it back to the board. Does the board have comments, questions? No comments, but I'm happy to make a motion to approve the item. Okay. All all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to ask the clerk to tabulate the votes. There were no protests oh, on that item. Thank you. <laughs> it's right in front of me. Okay, uh, the 955 item, human resources, updates to the uncodified schedule of classifications and compensation ordinance. Good morning, Suzanne. Good morning, Happy New Year. Um, Suzanne Holloway, Human Resources Manager. I'm here on behalf of Kate Sampson, who is unable to attend, unfortunately. The item before you today is to introduce an ordinance to amend the uncodified schedule of classifications and compensation ordinance to create a new classification of Sheriff's Communications Manager. Just to give you a little bit of background, back in November of last year, the Sheriff's Office approached Human Resources um, to research the possibility of creating a new classification to manage and coordinate the public and media relations activities, operations, and programs within the Sheriff's Office. This need was previously met by a public information assistant, but uh, the needs and the level of work has evolved over time to be more focused on critical incident response, strategic oversight, and policy development. After considering several different options with the Sheriff's Office, it was recommended that a new classification be developed. The position is also recommended to be placed in the unclassified service due to access to highly confidential and politically sensitive information, as well as the authority to communicate publicly on behalf of an elected, of an elected department head. Um, 
Absent comparable positions in the relevant labor market, the county executive officer determined that the internal alignment would be the best way to set the salary, and that was set at a level equivalent to the commu director of communications and public affairs. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, board members, any questions? Okay, seeing none, would the, are there any comments by the public? Any comments online? Okay. This is, um, requires no action since it is an update. No, it's, no, it's an introduction. An introduction. I'm so I'll move approval. And I'll second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? And now that it's, pardon? Yes. No, go ahead. Finish. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hearing none, the motion passes. Madam Chair, um, uh, Supervisor Gore made some comments earlier, but the Sheriff's Office was outside the room. Oh, and they now they're back in. So do you want to make your comments again? I'm just recognizing that it is a National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. So thank you to those so we of you have, who are so we have, we appreciate serving it. in law enforcement. <laughs> appreciate it. Yes, yes. Thank, you for, thank you for coming today. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to the next item is the Human Resources Inaugural Memorandum of Understanding between County of Placer and Placer County Deputy District Attorneys Association. Good morning, Nicole Lopez, Assistant Director of Human Resources. Thank you for having me this morning. I, it's my pleasure to present to you an inaugural memorandum of understanding with the Deputy District Attorneys Association with an, a, a, a memorandum of understanding, a codified ordinance to amend Chapter 3 of the County Code, and an uncodified ordinance to adjust compensation and benefits for the represented employees. By way of background, your board recognized the DDAA uh, as the exclusive organization representing employees in the classifications of deputy district attorneys and child support attorneys on November 6th of, uh, excuse me, 8th of 2022. Since that time, the county and the newly recognized organization have been engaged in collective bargaining on the inaugural memorandum of understanding that's before you today. The parties reached tentative agreement on, uh, with the members uh, and the members of the DDAA ratified the proposed terms and conditions by the majority of the vote on December 4th of 2023. The recommended terms for the MOU prioritize recruitment and retention of higher caliber employees through the alignment and the relevant labor market and restructuring the compensation package to highlight the competitive salaries. The proposed agreement offers steady wage increases over the term, improves regulatory compliance, and provides stability to all parties to support the continued provision of critical public safety and support services in our community. I'd like to thank those on the negotiation teams, including the representatives of DDAA, as well as HR staff, County Council, and Che Johnson, our outside counsel. I'm available to address any questions that you may have, but first I'd like to acknowledge Ben Eggert, who's here, president of DDAA, who might want to, did you want to say a few sure. words? Good morning to the board. Thank you for your time. I think I've met everybody here uh, just about at one point or another. I'm the president of the Placer County Prosecutors Association. Uh, we represent the, district, the deputy district attorneys in Placer County. And our association is proud to have the California District Attorney Association Prosecutor of the Year for medium-sized counties in our office, as well as the California Narcotic Officers Association Prosecutor of the Year in our office at the same time. Uh, together, our association works with Morgan Geyer to seek justice for victims of crimes in Placer County, as well as to protect our citizens. We're pleased that we've concluded negotiations with the county for our first MOU. We think that this MOU is a good first step towards strengthening Placer County's commitment to law enforcement by supporting our prosecutors. 
and our association looks forward to negotiations for our next MOU. Thank you, Ben. I'm available if you have any questions also. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ben. All right. Are there any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm pleased to support this. I think it's long overdue. Uh, our district attorney's office under the leadership of Mark and Geyer is number one in the state as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> I also serve on the Criminal Justice Policy Committee with Supervisor Jones. <clears throat> And it was our public defender's office under the leadership of Dan Kochel uh, brought forward uh, the fact that they're losing uh, attorneys from their office. And I think it was 16 this past year. <clears throat> and so um, it's important that we recognize and support our deputy district attorneys uh, and make sure that they uh, are paid uh, accordingly and because we don't want anybody taking them away from, uh, from Placer County. So thank you for your leadership on the negotiating team. I really appreciate it, and I move approval. I'll Any second. Other, no other comments or questions? I um, have one quick, oh God. Yes. Before, uh, before we move on, on, the re on the motion, could okay. I have Nicole read the requested actions into the record, please? Ab absolutely. Well, can we finish with our questions? Of I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> Nicole, we'll give you a minute to look it over while we take other. Yes, Supervisor No questions, Landon. just a comment. Just wanted to say thank you so much for the work that you do. We so appreciate that you are thoughtful and diligent and proactive in protecting our county. And we just acknowledge law enforcement, but you guys are a big piece of that as well, of making sure that on the prosecution side, things are done. So we um, can appreciate being in California, the difficulties that you have. So. Thank you for your work, and I very much support this. Okay. Thank Supervisor. So Supervisor Gustafson. Well, I think there's a guest in the audience that you might need to introduce. I just had a question <laughs> who that might be. Does it want to be on the camera? Oh, okay. Welcome well, anyway. Yeah, welcome anyway, and um, thank you so much. We so appreciate what the district attorney's office does as, as um, both Supervisor uh, Holmes and Landon mentioned, and I think we all agree that law enforcement can go so far as arresting, but if we don't have prosecution that sticks, we don't have a, a seamless law enforcement and protection for our community. So thank you for all that you do. Thanks for your diligence in working with us through this first process. And I stand committed to reviewing this as we move forward as other uh, agencies may up their salaries that we need to be back at the table too. Thank you, Supervisor uh -huh. Gustafson. And I would like to comment and say I'm thrilled, thrilled that we have this agreement and thrilled for all of you and really appreciate what you all do and how hard you do work. Thank we you, all, We all appreciate you very much for that. Thank you. So congratulations on that. Okay, Nicole. Um, well, first let me ask if there's any other comments from the, from the public, comments, questions? Anyone online? No. Okay, Nicole, you're up again. Excellent. The action requested is to adopt a resolution approving the terms and authorizing the chair to execute a memorandum of understanding between Placer County and the Placer County Deputy District Attorneys Association effective January 13, 2024 to June 30th, 2026. To introduce a codified ordinance waive oral reading to amend chapter three of the Placer County Code consistent with the memorandum of understanding and associated compensation changes. And to introduce an uncodified ordinance waive oral reading to adjust compensation and benefits for employees represented by the Placer County Deputy District Attorneys Association. Very well. Board? Okay. All right, we have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed abstain abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Karen, should we move? They've disappeared again. Okay, Let's, we are going to, since our sheriff are here, we're gonna move to um, item seven on the department items. This is post-retirement employment resolution for Greg Gregory, um, somebody's going to have to help me. Is it Ryber? Reber? Ryber. Okay. MD. And. Okay. All 
right, good morning, Chair. Good, good morning, Board. Uh, Mr. Chatney and Mr. Schwab. My name is Jerry Rogers with the Placer County Sheriff's Office. Here with me today is Lieutenant Josh Barnhart. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are here requesting to adopt a resolution authorizing the Sheriff's Office to offer Gregory Ryber, MD, post-retirement employment prior to completion of the California Public Employees Retirement Systems required 180-day waiting period. Placer County Forensic Pathologist Gregory Ryber, MD, has retired effective December 31st, 2023. At the end date of his retirement, it is estimated that four to eight cases in which Dr. Ryber performed autopsies will be pending forensic test results. These cases will remain open until all pertinent results are returned and Dr. Ryber is able to complete the necessary reports and sign off on certificates of death. Additionally, Dr. Ryber's retirement has created a vacancy for one of the two Sheriff's Forensic Pathologist allocations. To be eligible to hire as a Forensic Pathologist, it is required that the applicant have training in the specialty of Forensic Pathology and is qualified to take on, has successfully passed the examination to obtain board certification in Forensic Pathology. In partnership with County HR, the Sheriff's Office began recruiting this highly specialized classification in July of 2023. As of December 2023, this recruitment has only yielded four qualified candidates and the position remains unfilled. Uh, the Placer County Sheriff's Corners Unit has the unique and imperative responsibility to conduct complete and objective medical legal investigations surrounding reportable deaths within Placer County, the purpose being to determine circumstances, cause, and manner of death. Additionally, the coroner's unit is tasked with determining the identity of the deceased, locating and notifying the legal next of kin and safeguarding personal property. The Placer County Sheriff's Coroner's Unit completes on average 800 exams a year. It is critical that the coroner's unit have the staff, staffing required to complete this work. And for the purposes of continu uh, continuity and to help fill the critical staffing needs, the Sheriff's Office is requesting that Dr. Ira be allowed to return to work as needed. His employment status will be extra help and he will receive an hourly rate of $157.39. Government Code Section 7522.56 stipulates a CalPERS retiree must complete a winning period of 180 days for the retirement date before employment eligibility is reinstated. However, Government Code Section 7522.56F provides an exception if appointment is necessary to fill a critically needed position before 180 days have passed. It is under this exception that we request your board adopt a resolution authorizing Gregory Ryber, MD, to return to an employed status with Placer County to fill a critically needed position for the purpose of finalizing corner cases and to support the workload of the corners unit. And funding for this extra help position is available in the fiscal year 23-24 Sheriff's Corners Unit uh, budget in cost center 20003 under program 200032. And there's no impact to the general fund. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, board members, questions? Yes, um, and yes, Supervisor Gustafson. I'm sorry, my question is, I think, I believe yesterday I heard a number, I heard a lot of numbers yesterday yeah. on the tour. <laughs> That there's only 560? Uh, close. It's fi about roughly approximately 520 forensic pathologists throughout the country. Throughout the country. So mm -hmm. definitely a need for this wow. position. Very few applicants and quite a demand. And obviously we want to support this. So mm -hmm. just wanted to get that on the record. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Yes. yes. Um, so the recruitment is still open? That is correct. Yes. Indefinitely? Uh, open until filled. filled. Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Okay, my comment is that, so we have one other forensic pathologist currently? Currently, yes. Okay, is. well that poor person, this is <laughs> gonna make that person's day, isn't it? Because <laughs> I know that's probably a, an extremely large amount of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, any uh, public comment on this? Uh, anyone online? Okay, I'll be in. Hi, John Freitas, a uh, Roseville resident for 23 years. I don't know if I uh, know the uh, depth of this topic, but in just hearing it, has there been consideration of, uh, or is the need to be domiciled in the county, or can bodies be sent to other counties less impacted by numbers? Can doctors come from other counties 
temporarily into Placer to fill the need and then return? Very good question. I can answer that. Um, currently, we contract with a firm. Um, it's called NAG, is the abbreviation there, out of San Diego. It's a firm of forensic pathologists that provide services, and so they are uh, temporarily uh, helping us. Um, and so um, another part of that question was, uh, can the we move our services outside of the county? Well, at this point, we contract with five counties. Um, and our facility, uh, which is fantastic, allows us to provide that service. So they're depending on us, and uh, this is certainly going to help with that, with Dr. Ryber's retirement and coming back and working part-time. Okay, great. And any other comments on, online? Yes. No? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for your recommendation. Supervisor Jones, just to clarify okay. um, for the gentleman as well. So we were there yesterday in the morgue visiting, and so... Yuba County, Sutter County, El Dorado County, and Nevada County are all counties that utilize our coroner's office. Um, so they come to us um, because they are so small that they don't need oh, and can't obviously get a full-time forensic pathologist. pathologist correct. Um, so I really appreciate that comment. Um, and we're actually helping other smaller counties do the work they need to do. Um, and with that, I am happy to uh, move approval of the item as okay. requested all second okay it's been moved and seconded um all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. any opposed any abstentions hearing none the motion passes thank you. you thank you okay we'll move back to item six community development resource agency long range planning work program for all supervisorial districts good morning Chris and Chris. That's right. So good morning, Chair Jones, board members, Chris Pahuli, Placer County Planning Director. Uh, it's my pleasure to provide introductory remarks uh, on this item, which is our long-range uh, work program. Uh, Chris Schmidt, principal planner leading the long-range planning uh, section, will be providing the staff presentation. But before you get started, I wanted to make a, a few comments. As the board is aware, <laughs> I have three minutes. <laughs> right? Uh, as the board is aware, last year we moved forward with executing plans to reorganize the division into a long range or advanced planning section and a current planning section. The reason for doing uh, so was to have a long range team that was focused on efforts such as the general plan update and other advanced planning initiatives without being encumbered by working on private party development applications. With these changes, staff went to work in preparing a program that would guide the work of the team for the next three to five years. This was especially important to prepare given the kickoff of the general plan update, which will impact the team's ability to uh, complete other priorities in a timely manner. Today's presentation of the work program is the first of what I anticipate to be an annual report to the board um, uh, as a check-in on past year's accomplishments, status of multi-year planning initiatives, and a recommitment on priority initiatives. For today's presentation, Mr. Schmidt will review our long-range planning accomplishments over the last year and outline our upcoming work program while providing detail around some of the initiatives, such as the next zoning text amendment. Uh, with today's presentation, we're looking for feedback um, and direction from the board as to whether we have this right. Uh, the initiatives and whether we're missing any initiatives that the board um, thinks need to be added to the program. The scoping of some of those efforts, so some of the details around uh, the efforts such as the zoning text amendment, or perhaps I know we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the winery and farm brewery ordinance with today's presentation, so whether we have the scoping of those items correct, and the priorita prioritization, especially for in years out um, on the work program. Uh, following today's meeting and with input and direction from the board, staff will revise the work program accordingly and will make resource decisions based on the work program. So with that, I'd like to ask Mr. Schmidt to provide the staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Pahuli, and thank you, board members. Chris Schmidt, the Planning Services Division. 
As Mr. Pooley pointed out, uh, the Planning Services Division is split into two uh, divisions. Current planning, which are those private sector applications for rezonings, variances, subdivisions, use permits, et cetera. Um, the Long Range Planning Team is the entity or the group that actually prepares planning documents and takes a broader look at uh, planning and growth and development in the county. So a little bit of background. Uh, the Long Range team was reestablished in 2022, as Mr. Pooley points out, uh, mostly to focus on our general plan update. Uh, in the past, the general plan team has accomplished three to five long-term planning projects per year. As you all know, that state mandates have increased substantially in recent years, and the Long Range planning team is generally focused on uh, responding to those uh, changes. Uh, the, the department will use our work plan to allocate our fiscal and staff resources in the coming year. Uh, the work plan, it should be pointed out, includes more projects than there are resources available. Uh, work, therefore, work, uh, work plan prioritization is important, is important and will be evaluated on an annual basis. So our long range section includes four full-time uh, employees and one Civic Sparks fellow. We also have an intern working with us this year. And as uh, just a reference, the current planning section has 12 uh, planner positions with a couple vacancies. So the most common functions of our long range planning section is to create new and or update the general plan and our existing community plans, conduct public participation and engagement to ensure planning efforts meet the collective long range vision and values of not only the board but the community. We'll process amendments to the zoning ordinance, which we'll talk about. And then we also send um, planners to serve on regional um, organizations and working groups that uh, are working on things such as wildfire safety, evacuation planning, uh, biomass reduction, climate adaptation, groundwater sustainability, et cetera. So just a few recently completed projects that the board has seen from us over the past year or so. We did a package of zoning text amendments to update chapter 17, and that was mostly to implement housing uh, related uh, measures. We did a, adopt a beekeeping uh, amendment, and then chapter 17 amendments to align our zoning ordinance with the PCCP. A few projects underway and recently completed, the Tahoe Basin Area Plan Amendments was approved by the board uh, late last year. Also, the mobility info study that you, you had a workshop on recently was completed to look at you know, mixed-use development in some of our established communities that was completed. Underway is an update to the Auburn Bowman Community Plan, which uh, the draft document should be out late this spring, and we'll be starting the EIR on that effort uh, later this year. Uh, the Group Homes Code Amendment is a housing element program. I will be coming back to the board uh, sometime uh, later this year. Some more projects underway, as you know and heard about this morning. The Housing Arena Rezone Program is under the Long Range Planning Umbrella. A Placer Legacy Program was adopted in 2000. We're doing an update to that 24-year-old uh, plan. That'll be done this year. Electric Vehicle Readiness Guide is an implementation of the sustainability plan we're working on. And as you know, the general plan update is, uh, has been kicked off. So how do projects get placed on the work plan? So it's either state mandated, it's a requirement of our general plan, so an implementation measure of the general plan. The board has directed us to undertake a, a work effort. A staff recommendation, so the staff identifies a need for a program or an update, so we'll add that to the list and also plan implementation measures. So housing elements, sustainability plan, programs that um, are recommended to be implemented over the years in that plan. So we'll work on those as we have time. And the work plan is organized by themes. So we've organized it by general plan update task, uh, community planning, zoning text amendments, local ordinance and regulation updates, and then state mandated mandated programs and projects are prioritized based on schedule, so deadlines and also availability of staff. So the general plan update is our priority project or one of our priority projects and we're working on that um, now. We've been doing some MAC workshops, we'll be doing more later this spring. We are preparing an outreach program and strategy which the board will review in a couple months. 
we're starting to look at the existing community plans. We're looking at the existing general plan to see what programs and policies either need to be updated or have been completed. Uh, we're doing a market analysis and background report. We'll be doing some visioning and goal setting in the coming months. And we'll start looking at those sub-area plan background reports. So community plans that become sub-areas, we'll be doing some research on those. So the community planning projects, uh, we are expected to do another Tahoe Basin Area Plan Amendment. This one will focus on height and length uh, limitation changes. We're starting that work um, as we speak. There are some changes that we've identified needed in the Sunset Area Plan. These are just minor uh, edits, uh, mistakes, uh, corrections to area plan maps, et cetera. We're also looking at some tweaks to the, the land use limitations, and we'll be bringing that to the board hopefully later this year. Uh, this evacuation route analysis is a state uh, requirement, so either when you do your uh, general plan update or you update your hazard mitigation plan, you have to do an evacuation analysis. Uh, I know we recently just applied for some state money to help us with that effort, so it would either be under OES and or planning working on that. Uh, we do have some zoning text amendments. Um, every couple of years we do a housing or a zoning text amendment bundle. Right now there are 17 items on our bundle that we hope to start work on uh, this year, and we'll bring that together as a package. These are really just cleanups, um, loopholes, or uncertainties in our existing ordinance that we need to uh, make edits to that ordinance. And just a few of these that I'll point out, um, event definition change is really some uncertainty of whether a nonprofit um, entity can have events on private property. Is that considered an event, or at what point do they become an event center? Uh, structure definition change, uh, we need to clarify what points you measure. So when someone pad grades a lot, we want to measure from the proposed pad grade and not the slope of the, uh, slope of the land as it exists. Adding charging stations as a land use category. There's some cleanup to the definition for heavy commercial that um, we, we dropped one of our footnotes in the last cleanup that was a mistake. Um, minimum lot size clarifications, allowing some flexibility and minimal, minimum parcel sizes, and a few that didn't make the list because of space limitations. Looking at pool and equipment setbacks, especially on small lots. Electric fencing, which we don't have much of in Placer County, but we don't have any rules for. We've had one project in Sunset, in the Sunset area that had electric fencing and came as a surprise to uh, the fire department. So we're gonna add some requirements for the electric fencing. The existing ordinance has some limitations on porch size for accessory dwelling units, probably looking at um, changing that. And then some sign regulation changes. There's been interest in LED signs and looking at where those might be appropriate throughout the county. Uh, subdivision modifications, uh, the current zoning ordinance language says if you do a subdivision modification um, and it can just affect one lot, the, the zoning ordinance says it has to go to the planning commission. It's really a variance. We're going to change that so it only has to go to the um, zoning administrator. A development review committee change, there's some uncertainty about the establishment of the DRC. Uh, we're going to clean that up. Uh, that's a proposed a zoning text amendment as a standalone there will be a lot of interest in that change. These are more long-term, or the wish list from the planning staff is, re let's relook at our parking standards. I think for some land uses, we, re we require too much parking. A comprehensive sign ordinance update, so beyond the LED signs, our sign ordinance is really antiquated, so we want to clean it up and, and make it simpler to use. Other Ordinances and regulation updates that we've talked about in the past, updating our Oak Woodland guidelines. A winery ordinance update, I know there's some interest in making some changes to that. These, these are implementation measures for the sustainability plan, a greenhouse gas local offset program, so looking at laying the groundwork for that. Uh, we did receive a salt grant to prepare an agricultural plan, so we'll be coordinating with the agricultural commissioner and economic development on implementing that work program. Preparing an electric vehicle readiness guide. And also looking at development standards in the wildland urban interface area. That's a sustainability plan implementation measure. 
Also looking at doing a greenhouse gas inventory update, so that would update the inventory done a few years ago. This is also on the planner's wish list, is revisiting our landscape design guidelines, so doing a refresh to that document. A ridgeline protection ordinance has been on our long-range plan for a, a while. <laughs> also looking at, we have a bunch of various documents for design guidelines, looking to consolidate those and update those. And then at the end of the general plan, we're, we're potentially looking at a rewrite of our zoning ordinance, so a complete redo of the ordinance. So a few state mandated, program, state mandated programs. We have to do a general plan annual report, which we're starting to work on now. And then our housing element annual report. So those are both due to the state by April 1st, so we're looking at coming to the board with those uh, reports probably in March. Then a few programs that are on the, the planning department's work list are for housing element implement, implementation measures. So establishing a minimum density standard on the, in the RM, a residential multifamily zoning district. What we've seen in the past is some of our RM zoned land has really gone to low density um, developments and even detached. So looking to you know, protect our limited RM zoning. Zoning for residential uses on religious property. This is an implementation measure in the housing element. I will point out that SB4, which was recently adopted by the state, has really preempted this. So the state is allowing residential development on uh, religious properties. But we'll clean up our zoning ordinance to align with the SB4 requirements. Emergency and supportive housing is a cleanup to our existing rules to make sure we comply with state law and then some measures to encourage adaptive reuse and conversion of properties. So these are usually commercial properties where the market demand isn't there and residential use for affordable housing is maybe more appropriate. So we do establish priorities uh, based on four tiers, tier one state mandated. These are things we have to get accomplished and there usually are deadlines associated with that. Tier two is board direction or state or staff initiated. Tier three, implementing adopted goals, policies, or plans. So those are your implementation measures you've seen. And tier four are those wishful thinking, or if we ever have time, these are the things we want to accomplish. Tier four, not time sensitive and no deadline. So in the work plan, you do see a draft schedule of when we think we will be able to get to these items, but it's really gonna be based on board direction and allocation of resources. And some of these projects may get pushed off to future years or may drop off of program as uh, we move forward. So we did present the work plan to the Planning Commission on November 9th. Uh, the commission did ask um, what, just some clarification on um, what is the bona fide agricultural use definition. And that's really to align with the grading ordinance that defines bona fide agricultural use, but we don't define it in the zoning ordinance. So bringing over that definition to the zoning ordinance. Uh, the commission did recommend that we look at um, better ways to protect our TPZ properties, so Timberland Protection Zone properties. Uh, did express an interest or support for updating the farm and brewery ordinance and event set of regulations. And also noted that additional staff would be needed to complete all the programs on the work plan. Um, one public commenter supported the suggested TPZ property protections specifically not supporting any future cancellations of TPCs. And the comment, commenter also recommended stronger rules for development in the wildland urban interface, and the county should work harder to include the public in planning efforts through additional and wider outreach. Now, there is no board action requested today. We're just here for feedback, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Does anyone on the board have comments? Yeah, first of all, Chris, uh, let me thank you for your presentation to the Newcastle for Mac last night about the general plan. Pretty well straightforward. <clears throat> Even I can understand it. But uh, you did get some feedback from some of the folks, but you handled that really well. <clears throat> on uh, slide 13, I just need a little clarification. Uh, you've got a bona fide agricultural use definition change. Can you help me understand what, how that's going to work or what a bona fide agricultural use is? <clears throat> so the definition of the grading ordinance, really it, it lists those types of uses that are agriculture, mm -hmm. but it also says it is ultimately up to the agriculture, agricultural commissioner to verify that this is an agricultural use on the property. So 
a lot of our rules, there's more flexibility if you're agricultural, rather just a, a private property owner. So we really want to have a strong definition that says, if you're truly agriculture, say for grading, um, looser grading requirements, we want to make sure that you're bona fide agricultural use. So I know the engineering department worked hard to define that. They have it in the grading ordinance. We're going to bring that same definition over to the zoning ordinance to be consistent. So uh, sometimes people take advantage of these start uh, grading because they think they're agriculture and that's kind of tightened set up. Is that the purpose? Exactly. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I had a question on uh, the Tahoe Basin Community Plan amendments um, because it's showing completed or a board approved. It hasn't yet met with TRPA approval and there's litigation involved and there's now an opt-out provision for housing amendments that TRPA is bringing forward, and I don't see that. I'm assuming we're gonna have staff working on that. That is uh, correct. And it's part of long-range planning? It would be, yes. Okay, Yeah. so appreciate that. I think I, we see the rezone is a huge topic as well as um, the mobility and infill study and the Auburn-Bowman area. Those, these are all overlapping elements that I know you understand, but the public gets uh, confused by these multiple processes undergoing right. at one time. So I just want to make sure that we do our best, and I don't know what, what communication methods we need to explain to the public when and where their input is most effective. Yeah. Because they get frustrated when they come under public comment and we can't respond, and yet you know, I think the website's really clear. I looked at that. We got the uh, the timing of the public hearing out, but yet there's still very frustrating feeling we're not hearing them. We are hearing them, and we are directing um, for more action on that. So just whatever we can do to clarify these multiple processes um, that may affect one particular area with the, both the rezone, the infill study, and the Bowman, Auburn Bowman Community Plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We will do that. Um, I, I'd also like to point out, as, as uh, Mr. Schmidt mentioned, we will be bringing forward a uh, community engagement program related to the general plan update. Right. What's also um, interesting to note is that the city of Auburn is also going through their general plan right. update and doing outreach around it. Um, and so we're coordinating with their staff as well just to make sure that communications are clear because I, I agree there are there's a lot of outreach that we're doing and we want to make sure that people understand where best to engage um, yeah, with these multiple efforts. Yeah, and what the various efforts. topics mean. Exactly. You know, mobility and infill studies, you know, does the general public understand what that entails and what that might mean, so right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Supervisor Landon. Uh, I have a couple questions. One, um, around the winery and brewery update. Um, one thing I'm wondering is because obviously there are a number of things that may be low-hanging fruit that we can address when it comes to the winery ordinance, but there I think are broader issues beyond just the winery ordinance related to agribusiness. And so I'm wondering if as a board, um, having the direction that agribusiness, if this is how the rest of the board feels, of having the direction that agribusiness as a um, sector is an area of focus for us, not just the winery and brewery ordinance. Um, I'm not really sure how to phrase that or how to put that in as a priority. Obviously, I'm sure it will be part of the general plan update, but um, there, I think, are so many other pieces that fall under agribusiness that would be impacted by the wineries and breweries and vice versa. And um, especially when it comes to going through processes for farmers and ranchers or for people just in ag business in general. Um, I don't know how some of you feel about that, but that's one comment. <laughs> I don't really know it, what the question is. <laughs> yeah, if I may add on to, to, or may provide a little bit of a response um, on that. I, I think as we put this um, presentation together and put the work program together, uh, there's still additional work, especially related to the winery and farm brewery ordinance. Uh, as we were putting it together, it was before we knew about the um, Salk Grant Award on the uh, to prepare an agricultural plan. Um, we put it uh, put it on the list is um, is something that we think we have time to get to this year, uh, depending on the scope of what we actually end up changing. 
uh, but it may well be that um, there are some changes, some common sense changes to the ordinance that uh, that we may want to bring forward uh, with the board's direction. Um, and then some other components may, may be appropriate to wait until an agricultural plan is created using that SALK grant. And then that may lay out a work program for additional modifications to the ordinance. So I wanted to put that out there as well because there, I think there's a little bit more work to do on this one. Yeah, okay, great, that's fabulous. Um, and then on the on Placer Legacy, um, one question I have is when it comes, I was trying to find the slide, I don't remember what slide it was on, but um, for the long-term implementation of that program, um, what what is the long-term plan when it comes to who is going to be implementing that and who's going to be the head, I guess? Yeah, I think there's some additional conversations that, um, that we need to have internally um, or organizationally. Um, most of the implementation work has been done um, by planning staff, but I think there's some other conversations that need to be ha had um, related to implementation. Okay. Okay, great. I think those are my two for now. Supervisor Holmes. Oh, I just want to follow up on that. So is there a, <clears throat> someone that is in charge of Plaster Legacy, or is that just a... Uh, from the planning department, they have different. Yeah, there, there's a committee that meets uh -huh. um, to um, to review um, um, proposals for Placer okay. Legacy. I, I may actually um, bring up Greg McKenzie to talk more about that if okay. uh, if it's appropriate to do so. Oh, and it's coordinated out of the county exec. They coordinated, yeah. So yeah. there's not out of the county exec's office. Is that what I heard you say, Chris? Yeah. Welcome, Greg. Oh. Morning, Honorable Chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen, Greg McKenzie, your Placer County Conservation Program Administrator. Uh, yes, it is a committee. Uh, so as you know, Placer Legacy is a program, uh, implementation program under the general plan. So good topic for today's discussion. It implements the conservation open space elements. Um, it is the policy side, comes out of planning. The budget side, comes out of the CEO's office, and then there is a committee comprised of planning, PCP staff, agriculture, parks, natural resources, facilities, and others. I've probably left somebody out. Yeah. Uh, we meet to review proposals. In secret, they meet. <laughs> we meet to review proposals uh, for the legacy program and bring those forward to your board. Your board has discretion to implement Placer Legacy, and so uh, the, any proposal that comes to Placer Legacy, like one on the agenda after this one, yeah. uh, goes through that committee and comes to your board for approval. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, uh, Ms. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the presentation. And when I look at this, I'm sort of like, oh my goodness, y'all have a lot of work to do. And I think that's actually really important for us to see and for our community to see how many projects and how many um, different areas that need to be addressed and updated. Um, can I just hear a clarification about the question about the ag? Um, ag well, not the agribusiness, but there's the, the grant out there for this agricultural plan, correct? Correct. Which my understanding was we were gonna tie that into the general plan. It'll help inform the general plan. Um, we're working on the um, working on the scope and the schedule for the agricultural plan. It's very likely with the SALK um, uh, uh, timelines and deadlines that the agricultural plan will be prepared in advance of the general plan, and so will help inform the policies and programs in our general plan. Now, is that plan um, going to be run by your team? Um, we are working collaboratively um, with, uh, the, as uh, Mr. Schmidt mentioned, with the Agricultural Commissioner and with Economic Development. So we're kind of a three three legged stool right now working on it. Um, it's very likely that planning will play a major role in implementation of that. Because one of the things I think about is um, like that's a big initiative, right? And then you've all the rest of this, and we Absolutely. got some type of grant funding for it. And I'm just looking at. Is there a way to maybe bring in a consultant on one or two of these things, especially something like that, somebody who really understands agriculture, mm -hmm. who's done that, and maybe that's an opportunity to hire somebody to help with this process 
for that plan, right? right? Working with your team, and as I speak that, I see our economic yeah. development person. We, we absolutely up. will be bringing on a consultant team to assist. Yeah. But she jumped up, so <laughs> we'll I guess I hit the right, to... uh, the right chord. Go ahead. Thank Sorry. you. I'm Gloria Stearns, Economic Development Director for Placer County. Um, also part of the team that wrote the Salk grant, and right now we're busy working on the Salk agreement with legal, so that we can try to get the document approved and we can receive our funding as quickly as possible. That said, when we wrote the grant, we did write it with the intent of having a consultant assist us and most likely do some project management work to guide it. We knew in economic development the limitations of CEDRA at the time with the staffing constraints they had, also with the general plan update coming through. So we sort of plan on having help from consultants and then all of us sort of standing next to that project manager and helping them to succeed in the community. And also having heard some of the earlier public comments today, I'm very excited about this grant because I think there's a lot of people that are looking forward to discussing the preservation of agriculture in our community. And I think that's an important topic for this particular county. Terrific, great. Well, thank you. And maybe um, another question I have, which is probably I realized when you were sitting there, um, Gloria, is that as I read through this, I was questioning the ADUs and the deed restriction program that I had shared with you. I had heard that they're doing that in Napa County and we're having this issue with actually we've got ADUs and trying to figure out how we actually utilize them for uh, folks who actually are lower income um, and that there are deed restriction programs. But so I thought about this in this context and then I realized, Gloria, you are now overseeing the housing, right? So that program probably a little bit in conjunction with you would fall under your under your team, is that correct? There's a few divisions within housing and we're all, um, we're all happy with the way that things are laid out. So a lot of the policy decisions do go through CEDRA still, programs come through CEO, and we're still working on how we're going to handle all of the various Tahoe issues, um, especially with some of our staffing considerations. So we're like looking at that imminently. That said, it also ties into our Salk plan. The, one of the main reasons that the state gave us the SALT grant was because they were interested in our comments about housing for agricultural workers. And so that's something that we're going to be taking a look at and we'll have to work in lockstep with CEDRA as well because that would get into zoning issues, definitely. Um, okay, so in regards to the ADUs and the housing element, mm -hmm. right, there's a little bit of tie in there and Right, the house, housing, yeah. the housing element would go to CEDRA, correct, and programs would come to us in CEO. There is one of the things that we don't have um, here on, on the list are changes to the, um, to the housing ordinance. That's not currently on here, which depending on if there were changes to um, any of the uh, ADU language, if that was necessary, um, which may not be necessary to accomplish what we would like to, uh, but if there are any changes, that's currently not part of our work program. Okay. And I just, I, I want to share that I think that's really important since the ADUs, ADUs are part of our housing element. And if there are ways that we could actually have these deed restriction programs, that would lessen the need for us to look at rezoning other pieces of property for higher density development for, to meet our housing element. I mean, that's my hope. I, I know we still have to do that process, right? But I think that this is another tool in the toolbox that we really need to look at so that we don't have to do more of that um, rezone in the future. Um, and then I think I have one more question. Nope, that's it, thank you. And Supervisor Landon? Sorry, you're, you, you spawned a question from me. Um, would, Farm worker housing as an ADU also qualify if there was some deed restriction for low income housing? Yeah, it, it, they, they would count. If there are deed restricted units, they count from a production standpoint. So, okay. as we, as, um, as Mr. Schmidt mentioned, when we're working on our annual um, progress report, which we'll bring forward to you, as he mentioned, in March. Um, we're able to count units that are deed restricted, and so that helps with our um, goals of meeting the, the regional housing needs um, allocation for the for the county. Any other questions by the board? Um, I just have a question. 
regarding um, community plans and sub area plans. How are we going? How are you going to decide whether um, a community that has a community plan may become a sub um, area plan, or whether they get to, to remain a community plan? So it is part of the the task in our in our general plan update, and ultimately. I want to say the way we have it laid out in our scope of work is that we will bring it back to the board and that the board would make the decisions ultimately based on staff recommendation. Okay. Good. Yes, just to add to that, so we'll be looking at all existing community plans and scoring them. Mm -hmm. The criteria hasn't been settled, but it'll be, you know, development pressure, the age of the document, if the, the goals and policies are still relevant. But we'll also be working with the MACs and the public of we have your existing community plan, what do you want to do with it? And we'll get feedback from them. Come to the Planning Commission, ask for them to make a recommendation on which plans stay um, standalone, which ones get potentially updated, which ones disappear, or which ones become sub-area plans as part of the general plan. Ultimately, it'll be a board decision of which, what we do with those existing 15 plans. Great, perfect, great plan, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is just a presentation, correct? No action is needed. Public oh, public comment. Thank you for reminding me. Um, is there anyone out there who would like to make public comment? I think we have a couple. Good morning, board and uh, Chair Jones. Congratulations on your chairmanship for the year. Jocelyn Maddox, representing the Placer County Vintners Association. Uh, I just wanted to speak in support of Staff, uh, staff's recommendation on the winery and farm brewery ordinance update and maybe some of that low-hanging fruit and those uh, different approaches. I submitted a letter on behalf of the Vintners Association and the Farm Bureau yesterday to your board um, and I was glad to hear all the comments and additional um, from staff and the board on the SALT grant because we're certainly excited for that and ready to see how that's going to be implemented into long range planning. That brings me back to Supervisor Landon's comments on agribusiness. Um, certainly, uh, you know, of course the vintners are here for the ordinance, but we are part of a larger um, economy in Placer County, the rural economy and uh, farming, and we certainly support a larger vis visioning and long-range planning for agriculture in general. So just wanted to reiterate those things and thank you all for your support and comments. And thank you to staff as well. Thank you, Jocelyn, for your comments. Yes, more comments, public comments? Hi, Michael Garabedi, and I'll see if I can juggle a few things here. Thank you for the very informative presentation. As, as usual and as the other efforts to reach out to the public. Um, I think uh, uh, th there's, uh, I think you should start over though, I, because the public has not been outreached to in any meaningful way to find out what they want for the future. It's, it's just not there. You're deciding what you want and they aren't. Now the classic example of this was Supervisor Euler when they were discussing what to do with the, the, the center you know, where, where you own land. And there was a back and forth where he kept insisting, we go to the private sector, let's wait for the private sector. And that's what the county seems to be awfully good at doing, but not in reaching, at reaching out to the public. So, so, <laughs> the, the, uh, plastic, the, that sector is um, really uh, speaking, gets a much bigger voice, voice than, than the public. And this is the time to go back and really start over and start with the public, with a survey and things like that and do, do the plan, what planning is really involved, for planning here doesn't seem to involve going to the public in a meaningful way, just telling them what you're deciding to do. Really, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not too much. Um, and I'm glad you're all thinking about it, and now, you, now it's time for the public to, to learn what these issues are. Um, so just to go through some really things really quick, Wui uh, is, it doesn't include the forest, we're lo losing forest lands, of course, to forest productive, we're also losing grasslands, and, Vernal Fruit Prairie, Prairie and so forth. Um, I'll try to hit a few points here. Um, see, it's hard to know where to start. The, uh, I need to find out what the Oak Woodland reg, uh, regulations are. I'm not familiar with those. Uh, it's good that you're working on some, some other things. Um, 
the, the county has a way of approving projects that are in the way of uh, air pollution from the rail yards. I mean, this is a potential threat to the rail yards, but that, that area next to the rail yards that is in the county has approved two different projects there that are in the Air Resources Board report and study from a decade or two ago, uh, rezoning, changing the general plan, putting people right there next to the major repair facilities. And it's, it's a good example of the planning department coming before you and not addressing that at all when they make the presentation to you or, or the commission. The, you know, the, the real serious pollution problem with cancer contours that are ignored in the planning process. Um, so, uh, uh, ridge lines, oh my goodness, it's about time. We did something on ridge lines. You know, there was litigation over the Forest Hill Divide Community Plan that led to a fire, a fire uh, study done for there. And, and, uh, and in that process, and it, you know, it was predicted what would happen if a fire came up that, up, up that, up that hill and uh, has never been adequately developed by, you know, dealt, dealt with the development up on that rim. Um, I'm going to have to organize a, a better uh, presentation on this. Um, I think that my time may be up, but uh, I think the most important I think I've sa said is to um, step back and stop uh, where you're going right now until the public has a say and knows they have a say. And no, here is a whole room full of people who should have been here. They don't even understand, I guess, or know that they should be. This is where the decisions are being made affecting their future. And there are all these different processes. And a final point, Placer County Conservation Plan. Everybody says there were many, many meetings and the public was there and they'd had a chance to participate. If it's a meeting like this where the public's not here, they're gonna say, look, the public had a chance to tell you about the, what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any uh, comments online? Yes. Oh, we have one more in the room. Can we? Good morning, Supervisor Jones, uh, board members, uh, Karen and Daniel, uh, Wayne Nader. I, I just wanted to follow on something that uh, uh, Supervisor Gore said about ADUs. Uh, I want to commend the county for really taking a leadership role on the ADUs and uh, coming up with programs both in planning also in the building department to really expedite these kinds of projects. As you're probably aware, they, uh, the building department actually has, and maybe it's through the planning department, four different plans that they can provide to people who have an interest. So that makes it so much easier. Plus, again, a, a completely expedited project for that. And I think as we look at housing, there's obviously a lot of pressure to get that accomplished in a short period of time. Uh, the, uh, feasibility of that is really in question. When we try to do these larger projects, uh, such as the Mercy Housing, if it's not subsidized, it really doesn't happen. And so uh, what way can we do this through the public process rather than having to subsidize it? And ADUs, uh, uh, Sue Thompson, who's a uh, realtor here in town, uh, she's built two ADUs, and uh, they're really nice. Uh, and she built them for $250,000. If you think about the Mercy housing, uh, each one of those doors cost over $500,000. So if we can uh, push forward even more on ADUs, and I think if we can make the public even more aware of how feasible this is, how the county has really made it so much more of an easy process to get through, we might actually see more of these happening. So. Uh, just want to commend the county on the process they're already doing, hoping they can continue to communicate to the community just how easy this is, and maybe we can get more of them as an offset for some of this housing requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. We have some online? We do, Chair. Amy, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, it's actually Ivana. Um, good uh, morning, dear Chair Jones and our County Board of Supervisors. Um, wishing you all a happy 2024. Um, really excited to be here on behalf of our Roseville Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, my name, like I said, is Rana Godbon. I'm the CEO of the Chamber, representing over 1,100 member businesses in our region. And today I'm really on behalf primarily of our wineries and breweries to speak in support of the same item that our uh, Wine and Ale Trail also represented today. 
Uh, I wanted to highlight the importance of updating the winery ordinance to ensure economic growth of the wine industry in Prosser County. Uh, while we really need to consider the quality of life of our residents in these communities, absolutely, uh, we also urge you to carefully balance these considerations with the potential of fostering economic development and growth uh, within the wine and ale trail. Uh, by addressing and updating the winery ordinance, this industry will really be allowed to flourish, create additional opportunities for our local businesses, and create economic growth for our region. Uh, we really hope that this project is addressed as proposed on the timeline for 2024, and we highly encourage for it not to be pushed back beyond 2024. Uh, and we look forward to partnering with the county staff and the county board of supervisor on any way we can support um, the future growth of our region. Uh, I really want to support the comment that Supervisor Shanti Landon made in regards to ag business being a sector of focus. Uh, we definitely support and would like to add that to our um, align with you on that being an area of focus for also our local chambers and really ensuring that we support them, not just in the common sense changes that were spoken about, but also in the long term vision for that sector and how it could really drive our region economic growth. So thank you so much for your time. And also really, uh, I'll be submitting a letter with these comments. What I'd like to also add is workforce housing. We really appreciate the focus on workforce housing and affordable housing as that is a key um, barrier to employment for most people looking for entry level positions in our region. Uh, we hear from our hospitals and other employers that are struggling with employees accepting jobs due to the affordability of housing. So really appreciate your support of the infrastructure development for affordable housing and what you're doing with ADUs and the focus of the county on that. So thank you so much for your time, your leadership in ensuring to make Placer County the best county in California to do business and live in. So thank you so much for your leadership and efforts. Thank you for your comments. Robert, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Yeah, hi, uh, Chairman Jones and board members. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak here just for a second. Name is Rob Haswell. I'm the executive director of the Placer County Visitors Bureau, uh, working uh, with uh, Gloria's team in economic development uh, and a lot of our partners. Uh, just here to lend my voice to uh, that of, of uh, Rana and Jocelyn in terms of support of the update of the of the wine ordinance and the continued emphasis uh, by your board on uh, the long term visioning when it comes to agriculture and agritourism super important sector and and I really believe we're at a at a um, turning point uh, as far as that as that sector goes and. Um, I know you all the board has been supportive of it, so I, I agree with Rana that it'd be great to have that be a prioritized um, planning uh, item for the for the for this uh, 2024 year. So again, thank you so much for all your work and and your dedication to this important uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. No further comments, Chair. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Supervisor Gore. I just have one more question, which I didn't find in my notes as I was leafing through. Chris, you had mentioned the evacuation route analysis, or, well, you're both Chris, so Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned that either OES or planning will be doing that. We obviously just are looking at getting a grant or got a grant. Yeah. We spoke about that this morning. So do we know who's gonna take the role lead or do you have to work together? We do have that OES team, but they probably have to work with you all as well, correct? So we have it as an optional task in the general plan update. So if we don't get the grant, we'll be doing it under planning, of course, in coordination with OES and others under the general plan umbrella. Otherwise, if we do get the grant, it'll be a planning OES joint effort. So it'll be a joint effort either way, okay. but it, the grant has been applied for under OES. Okay. And, you know, and to the point of contracting out some work, you know, if that's an option with this grant, I just think because there are so many projects, if there are some opportunities to do that, I think our board would be supportive so that we can move forward and make progress. On them. Thank you very much. We'd anticipate it would be a consulting helping us. Great. With the, it's a very thorough analysis that the state requires. Dave, would you like to make a comment? <laughs> I mean, they spoke your department. Uh, 
just uh, support what Chris said, uh, actually on your consent agenda is actually another grant that we're also going for uh, on this very same topic. And so we work very closely with planning, obviously, as I mentioned, in the community wildfire protection plan, all these plans kind of have to be in alignment and we're working really hard to get them synced up so that you know one follows the other in a natural progression so that as we get new information and evacuation, that'll feed back into the safety element, which will feed into the general plan and then feed the other plan. So a uh, lot of different work going on in the state and the federal level in this front. And we're all kind of working in the background to try to figure out how to put these together in some kind of semi-logical fashion that doesn't uh, keep having to study the same thing over and over in a slightly different way so we could be efficient and uh, effective. So that was it's it. It's a great plan. That way when people look at one ordinance and another one, they're not conflicting. Good plan. Okay. Any other, that does it for all of our comments. Uh, this is a presentation, so no action is required. I want to thank you both. Great presentation. Look thank forward you. to uh, more work on it. Okay, we're going to move on to um, item eight, Community Development Resource Agency, Placer Legacy Use of Funds Agreement, Placer Conservation Authority, Red Wing Grant Funded Conservation Lands Acquisition, Supervisorial District 2. All righty. Welcome, Greg. Good morning again, honorable chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen, Greg McKenzie, your Placer County Conservation Program Administrator. I'm joined by Sadie Caldas this morning, representing the Placer Conservation Authority, a joint power agency formed between, by and between the city of Lincoln and Placer County to implement the conservation and mitigation uh, implementation side of the Placer County Conservation Program. Um, <clears throat> I will start off this morning um, <clears throat> with the actions requested. I will read those into the record for you. Okay. So our first ask is to approve a Placer Legacy Use of Funds Agreement with the Placer Conservation Authority in the amount of $400,000 to provide local mitigation matching funds to acquire an approximately 430 acre portion of the Riosa Red Wing Ranch property and authorize the board chair designee to execute the use of funds agreement and any amendments to the agreement subject to risk management and county council concurrence. Two is to approve a FY23-24 budget amendment, open space in the amount of $400,000 and cancel open space fund reserves in the amount of $400,000. Three is to authorize the deposit of funds into the Placer Title Red Wing escrow account in the amount of $400,000. And finally, determine the proposed actions are not a project pursuant to the uh, California Environmental Quality Act. We have a presentation for you this morning with a few slides on it. I see that is up. So what are we working on here this morning? The good news for 2023, fall of 2023, we were awarded uh, a uh, roughly 4.2, $4.3 million grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, nationwide, there are about $54 million awarded out of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for similar purposes, about $22 million came to the state of California, and we were approximately a quarter of that ask. So with that, the California Wildlife Conservation Board has seen fit to match that grant at the state level uh, with approximately $1.1 million from the Wildlife Conservation Board that we're currently working on. So total, almost $5.4 million out of the state and uh, federal funds. So where do, because this question came up in earlier public comment, I proactively address that, where do funds from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for conservation purposes, where are those derived from? So in 1964, Congress approved the Land Conservation Fund. That fund, and the funds within it are derived from federal offshore oil and gas lease revenues. They earmark a portion of those funds for land conservation purposes. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a grant program. It was permanently authorized, I want to say two, maybe three years ago now, the way time flies. Uh, and so with that permanent authorization annually, we have an opportunity with the conservation program to apply for federal 
funds, grant funds, to assist with the acquisition of conservation lands. So non-mitigation conservation lands. I'll get into that a little bit further on additional slides. So today we're asking uh, from the Placer Legacy Program a match of $400,000. So where is the property located? It's located just east of the town of Sheridan, uh, 430 acres, immediately adjacent to the north of the Rios of Red Wing Ranch South property. That was a acquisition from, uh, I think we finally closed escrow on that, 560 acres uh, last year. It also received state and federal grant funds to assist with the uh, approval of that. And I have a slide later on that speaks to all the funding. But you can see the block of conservation that is occurring east of Sheridan. Uh, it's within our reserve acquisition area. Uh, it is agricultural land. It is in grazing. A grazing lease will continue on that property, much as grazing continues with the Bradley family. On the Bradley property, we have a rolling 10-year grazing lease with the Bradley family on that property. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sadie to give you a little bit of detail regarding the, the site and uh, its environmental attributes. Uh, good morning. I will tell you a little bit more about the property and some of the resources. Uh, this visual is an aerial, aerial photo showing some of the habitat and aquatic resources on the Red Wing North property and also on the adjacent conservation lands that are currently in the PCCP reserve system. This area is very valuable for special habitats and com conservation. This stream system that goes through it is Yankee Slough. Um, you can see from the photos there's a lot of wetlands in this area and there's also vernal pools. And this map shows the outline of the Red Wing North property in red, and the aquatic resources on the property are also in color. The rusty pink color, it goes diagonal through the property uh, with the yellow surrounding it. That's where Yankee Slough goes through the property. The yellow represents over 65 acres of riparian wetland. The blue is 11, over 11 acres of seasonal wetland. The bright pink is over 13 acres of vernal pools on the property, and the bright green represents over 14 acres of vernal swells on the property. With these resources, the Red Wing North property provides suitable habitat for 20 special status species. Examples of special status species may include uh, species that have been listed by the Federal or the California Endangered Species Acts, is endangered, threatened, at-risk species, or they may have another type of protection status. Eight of the 20 species that the property provides habitat for are covered species by the PCCP. This slide shows known species covered by the PCCP that have been found on the Red Wing North property or in this wetland complex. All three of them have a threatened status by either the Federal or the California Endangered Species Act. The first one is the Vernal Pool Fairy Shrimp, and there have been multiple occurrences of this species throughout the property. The second one is the California Black Rill. It has had documented occurrences in this wetland complex, which have been right near the, one of the property lines for the Red Wing North property. And the third is the tricolored blackbird, and there have been occurrences of the black blackbird on the Red Wing North property. And this photo is to show an example of one of the vernal swells on the Red Wing Ranch property. Uh, as you can see in this photo, there's lots of flowering plants, which makes the vernal swell stand out, and it's a lot easier to see in this photo. And thank you. This concludes my portion. I'll hand it back over to Greg. Thank you. So between the 430 acres to the north, the prior 560 acre acquisition to the south, we're looking at 990 acres of conserved lands in Western Placer. Uh, the state and federal contributions to that effort, almost $12 million. Uh, the prior Placer Legacy grant to match the 560 acres was $445,000. So all combined, uh, looking at roughly $845,000 of legacy contribution 
to match um, a significant amount of state and federal funds. It's from uh, what I can tell in, in history, looking at perhaps the largest leveraging of uh, the legacy funds for state and federal grant funds or, or other funds for that matter. Um, the slide says 15%, $845,000 is actually 7%. Uh, so as you compare that to other acquisitions that we've made, normally those acquisitions come in at least at kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. In this case, uh, significantly higher leveraging of those funds to acquire lands and, and resources, as you can see from the picture. So this forms a significant block in western Placer County, just the, between the, the county and the Placer Conservation Authority's efforts between the Bradley property, Red Wing North and South, conservation easement on the Ellis property, which the Ellis's continue to own and manage their cattle operation on almost uh, 2,000 acres. Uh, when combined with other efforts in this area, the Wildlands East Sheridan Mitigation Bank, a piece of property that uh, the Placer Land Trust holds, uh, the Yankee Slough Mitigation Bank to the southwest, roughly around 3,000 acres in this uh, block of conservation, a significant amount of funding going towards that, not only uh, grant funds, but also mitigation funds. So far, about $5 million towards uh, this area have come in from mitigation dollars on other properties. So one of the things I always like to do is get back to what are the differences between and similarities between Placer Legacy and the PCP. So, the PCP is an implementing program under Placer Legacy. It's really nested within Legacy. It's designed to implement kind of the regulatory side, but also um, the conservation side of the program. With the adoption of the conservation program, it opened a lot of conservation pots of money to the county and the Conservation Authority and PCWA and Sparta and the City of Lincoln, the permittees under the program, uh, and so it's been our uh, policy and now practice to chase as much of that funding as we possibly can at the outset. Uh, as you can see from this grant, we've been successful. I'll talk about another one in a second. But Placer Legacy is countywide. Conservation program is focused on basically west of Highway 49. Really very similar um, goals and objectives relative to open space and agricultural conservation and preservation. But legacy is really that conservation only funding source, whereas the PCP actually pulls in the mitigation, and mitigation is required to fund its fair share. So the conservation actions we are asking for today and that we've taken in the past and will take in the future, those are above and beyond what mitigation requirements are. So uh, before I get back to your board's action, just a couple of things we're looking forward to in the coming year. You heard from planning relative to their uh, program. They are currently working to update the Placer Legacy program now with the advent of the conservation program. Uh, we expect here in the, the new year for uh, Joss Hunsinger's department to bring forward a proposal for the Western States Trail acquisition to shore up the access and availability of sites along that trail for the western states. Um, we have applied for uh, another grant, the Moyer West property. It's another 261-acre property out Sunset Boulevard in western Placer where we are seeking additional grant funds for that. Don't know if we'll be successful, but we figured, hey, while well, well, we've got the ball rolling and a good track record, let's continue to apply for those. And then your board has heard uh, here at a recent board meeting the Tykert property, the roughly 4,200 acres uh, in western Placer County along Raccoon Creek uh, has been sold. The entity that has purchased that we are in active negotiations with to see if there is a role for the county, legacy, the PCA, Placer Conservation Authority, state and federal grant funds, other funding sources it will take likely a lot of uh, sources and will to bring forward as much of that land into conservation as possible, but that's our goal from a staff perspective. And so with that, I'll uh, give it back to your board. I, wrote you, I wrote, read your action into the record, so hopefully you don't need to repeat that, but we're available to answer questions should you have any. Okay, so I'll bring it back to the board. Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Madam Chair. Um, Greg and Sadie, incredible job in securing uh, the additional funds. I mean, that is remarkable. I don't know of many grant opportunities in which so little has brought so much. So thank you. Do we have, I, I think as we promote um, what we're trying to do in conservation lands, obviously the National Fish and Wildlife and I mean, to get to secure that kind of funding for this area shows the significance they think it plays. Um, is it also in migratory birds and, and species? I mean, we need to, I think, help educate our public at what an important area we, we protect in Placer County as both residents and these efforts. So. Yes, and so we do work directly with Wildlife Conservation Board and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Their public information officer actually lives around the corner from me, so I run into her routinely on, on walks and bike rides. Uh, and we are collaborating to get the word out as to what is occurring. She obviously lives local and has an interest in, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in um, promoting that, as do we. Um, obviously, we're waiting on this to get all the funds aligned and everything in place, but actually I heard from the county's PIO yesterday and we fully intend to send out a press release on this one, should we be successful. I will mention, I was remiss in not mentioning it, you should in your record have a letter from former Supervisor Robert Wygant yes, and late oh. last night an email from my predecessor, Lauren mm -hmm. Clark, kind of explaining the connection and uh, yeah, the, the word nesting comes, you may recognize it from Lauren Clark and the fact that Placer Legacy and the PCP Legacy, or the PCP is nested within uh, the Placer Legacy program. So I always do my best to conjure some Lauren Clark statements and that's one of his words I always like to use, so. Well, when we look at 20% of, of all of the allocation to the state of California, that's amazing effort on our parts to make that happen. So thank you both. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Landon. Uh, just a comment and a question. Um, well, first, I completely echo what Supervisor Gustafson said. I mean, really quite incredible work from you and your team. And I just I think it's amazing. And I agree. I wish everyone could know. I do see you on Instagram. So I know that the PCCP is on Instagram now. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, my question is, do you know what it looks like for future funding with the state budget deficit when it comes to these types of funds? If they're coming from the feds, will we be impacted by that, do you think? Yes, uh, difficult question to answer. Um, the $1.1 million from the state uh, with the advent of the conservation program that opened up um, Proposition 68. So much, much of the funding coming to the Wildlife Conservation Board comes out of propositions and bonds. And to so the extent the governor and the legislature has ability to pull any of those back, they can, hopefully in this case, these are grant funds which uh, have come through propositions approved by the voters, released for the current cycle. So this, this cycle of funding was already approved. So hopefully we are in good shape to leverage these funds. Next year's funds, however, might possibly be at risk. Um, you know, one of the other things that I always like to tell folks about the Land Conservation Fund is, you know, offshore oil and gas leases by the federal government. To the extent that revenue diminishes, hopefully we will find a source to replace those funds with over the course of time. If, if those continue to go the way they're going, we'll see a reduction in those funds long term. But like most things, hopefully, you know, things ebb and flow and policies come and go and we may have a whole new revenue source that we're not aware of in 10 years from now that will replace that one and we'll continue to work diligently. But thus far they've been holding up their end of the commitment relative to helping to fund conservation in Placer County above and beyond the requirements of mitigation. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, my only question is, uh, explain a little bit how the offshore drilling revenue works. Is that something that the, gov the feds require them, the offshore companies, to give to the federal government and then they distribute it out for 
purposes like this? Yeah, those federal offshore oil and gas leases basically have a requirement that earmarks a portion of the revenue going to the federal government into the land conservation fund to fund efforts like this for imperiled species, for conservation lands across the nation. We've been very fortunate the last two years to leverage a significant amount of these funds. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really a function of that act and, and Congress directing those funds. Um, that could change, so we always uh, want to obviously be proactive and grab as much as we can while we can. Uh, and so far, we've been successful in that, and hopefully that track record will continue. Right. Well, that seems like it might be a little bit more predictable than, say, um, revenue from the state, especially when we're talking about um, tax revenues from residents in the state of California. Okay. Are there any uh, public comments, questions? Thank you, Michael Garavidi, and the very another useful presentation, very important. So I'm going to try to round some things out a little bit about this program. Uh, first, as you all may know, it's 450 square miles of the county. It's rather a rather a large project, and um, the uh, uh, what what is not. I'm going to talk about what they didn't bring, don't bring to you. You know, he mentioned what they do bring to you, but they didn't really mention what they don't bring to you, and. Um, Probably a good thing for responsible members of the Board of Supervisors to do is to look at their intake list. You know, all these different projects and things that come in intake and it goes on and on and on. I looked at an early list there. And you know, some, the thing is all the people who live there who don't know how they'll be affected if they want to do something. One, one issue that has surfaced is people who need to add a, a house or something for a growing farm family or something like that might have to pay $5,000. I asked him a couple times in public. It, it varies, it varies. But, uh, but th th that, you should look at that list and see what's going on. And the independent review team, the last I knew, this is the secret meeting co convened by the Army Corps of Supervisors, as far as I know, state agency people, and who, who knows go who goes there because it's not it's not uh, open to the public. Uh, so these people are the ones that apparently communicate through the staff directly to the county. Now let's talk about the county. Does PCCP have any presence at the Desedra desk? No. You go there and want to talk to someone, you have to call call him up on the phone. So how does the public even go in and say, "Gee, how do they get started asking questions um, about uh, about what it's doing?" Um, so uh, uh, the, another question to ask is what is sacrificed to get these projects? You know, wh what is sacrificed for agriculture, whether it's by uh, the uh, park, you know, the, the trails being built or the in interference with agriculture uh, in Hidden Falls, um, the, uh, the, the land that's taken, I mean, Carvana, for instance, that took out both the state and federal wetlands and, you know, to build that thing there. Um, and, and they use this, the PCCP, as an excuse. It's, it's referred to. Uh, all the development that's taking place that's, that's destroying vernal pool, grasslands. We talk about wildland over an interface. You know, we've had grass fires burning right up to two different sides of the Carvana thing. I mean, there's a wildland urban interface issue for there with 10,000 cars parked there, EVs, who knows. I don't mean to get off on that tangent. But um, we really need to be look at, looking at what's lost and what PCCP is being is a use, used as excuses for development, developers, like I, I mentioned earlier, the, the private community coming and deciding what to do with our land and then going through this group, the, these meetings, the secret meetings, and, and proceeding and relying on that increasingly, seeing, seeing relying on PCCP, which, as you know, I think <laughs> at least one of you or some of you have been involved in, in the uh, Placer Conservation Authority, uh, and it does, it does have a, 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 an advisory group, too, that it meets occasionally, but the, the public didn't know at the start and still doesn't know now basically what it does, and I think that list, their intake list, would uh, think just to look at and see if you have any questions about it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else in the audience? Is there anyone online? Gotcha. Okay, so we'll bring it back to the board. Any other further comments or questions? No? I will move approval. I will Happy. second. All right. We have a motion and a second. And we need a roll call. We do. Landon? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Gustafson? Yes. Gore? Aye. Jones? Aye. Great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to item.
9, and then we are going to take our break for closed session following item 9. Oh, I'm sorry, 10. I can't count either. <laughs> After item 10, and then we'll come back for item 11 and following our closed session break. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Jones um, <laughs> and members of the board. Uh, Amy Ellis here with the Adult System of Care to present an action item for your board's consideration today. Um, it is to approve an umbrella agreement with multiple private psychiatric hospitals, and there's a list attached in your staff report, for intensive mental health services in a maximum aggregate amount of $4.5 million from July 1st, 2023, through June 30th, 2025, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to execute the agreements with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So both the adult and the children's system of care are mandated and responsible to uh, pay for acute psychiatric inpatient hospital stays for eligible Placer County Medi-Cal Medi residents who've been evaluated, are referred for further inpatient psychiatric evaluation and treatment under um, you know, the, w and the Welfare and Institution Code Section 5150. Um, over the last couple of years, there continues to be a steady increase in need for hospitalization. So from, there was a 6.5% increase from fiscal 2021 to 21-22, and then we saw a 9.5% a increase from fiscal year 21 to 22, uh, 21, 22 to 22, 23. So residents um, being placed for evaluation uh, in hospitals, they're at imminent risk for harming themselves, harming others, or they're unable to care for their basic needs due to a, a mental disorder. Uh, the private hospitals included under this umbrella provide those necessary inpatient stays for children. It's our, it's our only resource for the children. And then on the adult side, we really just only use these if our county contracted psychiatric health facilities are at capacity because we can draw down more federal share from the, the other facilities. So funding for these agreements um, under the agreement is capped at $4.5 million. And using an umbrella like this allows us flexibility to place in facilities that have been available, uh, uh, that are available to us. All costs have been a budget, budgeted, and I'm happy to answer any questions on this one. Okay, board members. Yes, Supervisor Gore. Oh, oh. no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, so we've got six uh, umbrella psychiatric hospitals. Uh, what happens when there is no bed available? What's the delay? I know some of these are filled. Uh, do you have any idea what the time frame? Yeah. Is? Um, so if there are no beds available, uh, well, well, that's why we try to contract with as many as possible mm -hmm. so that that doesn't happen because it's kind of unfortunate they stay longer than maybe they should in an emergency room. Yeah. Um, or, or, yeah, that's, or on a, on a puff. Um, so maybe they, you know, are ready, they're stabilized on a puff and need to go to a longer term stay. The, there's no beds available so they would stay longer than necessary somewhere where they where it's not as comfortable and the right place for them to be. Right. And so what's, uh, how long can uh, someone be in one of these uh, umbrella psychiatric hospitals? Is there a time limit or? It really, uh, it really varies. Uh, um, you know, these ones are typically just used for um, in post crisis for, mm -hmm. on those holds. And so it's their shorter term, but then we have other hospitals that are like pretty long term where they they might live for a year two years maybe more depending on the nature of their their impairment are those particular hospitals available in the area we have one hospital like that in our area in the in the it's uh but it's you know they're they're all different so somehow specialize in individuals who have physical need physical health care needs some are just on a med so we have so we have one but um it really serves just a small percentage of the total that we have to place most of them go outside of the area for that level of care okay thank you any other questions board members is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment or has questions anyone online Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions or 
Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay, we'll take care of item 10 before we take our break. Item 10, out of, no, yes, uh, out of country travel request for the Greater Sacramento Economic Council German market visit. Ten, that's 10A. Good morning. We or afternoon. We hit afternoon now. Thank you and no, happy barely. 2024 all of you and congratulations, Chair Jones. It's Thank good to you. see all of you this, this year here. Um, I'm Gloria Stearns with Placer County Economic Development and today's formal action requested of your board is to approve the out, approve out of the country travel for District 1, Placer County Supervisor Bonnie Gore and Placer County Economic Development Principal Management Analyst Paul Griffith to attend the Greater Sacramento Economic Council German Market Visit. With that now read into the record, let's discuss the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, also known as GSEC, trip to Germany. Placer County partners with GSEC for regional economic development and has done so for seven years. With the fairly recent approval of the Placer Commerce Center and Placer One Developments, plus with your board's significant investment in infrastructure, Placer County is in the fortunate position of having land available for industrial use. It's time to recruit businesses. One of the recent collaborations with GSEC, the City of Roseville, and Placer County is the recruitment of Bosch to the former TSI site, where Bosch will update the facility so that next generation semiconductor chips can be manufactured. Bosch has already been awarded $25 million in Cal Competes tax credits and is being evaluated for additional funding from the Federal Chips and Science Act program. Semiconductor manufacturing is becoming a regional strength in the Sacramento area with Solidime, Blaze, Intel, and now Bosch. These are family supporting jobs. But for economic development nerds like me, the best part is the multiplier. For every one job on the Bosch campus, five jobs are created out in the community to support that effort. For perspective, typical manufacturing is one to four and government is one to one. If Bosch grows to have 500 jobs on their campus, the jobs off campus grow to 2,500. So semiconductor manufacturing jobs are very important. GSEC is hosting a trip to Germany to talk to Bosch and other companies who might be interested in setting up operations in Placer County. GSEC made the arrangements and invited Placer County Economic Development staff, as well as members of the GSEC board, which includes Supervisor Gore. We have heard at last count about 15 representatives from the region are going on this trip. Here are the facts. The dates of the trip are February 3rd through the 10th. GSEC gave us a flat rate cost of $4,500 per person, and that includes, and these are estimates, $1,300 for flights, $1,100 for hotels, 600 for meals, ground transport of 350, an event in Stuttgart for 400, administration fees of 225, and contingency fees of 550. There are also incidentals like airport parking, mileage, and etc., which get the total cost of the trip for two people to 9707 with 34 cents. That averages out to about 4850 a person. The agenda is to travel on the 3rd and 4th of February. On the 5th, they will tour the Aachen University Zero Emission Vehicle Hub, which serves as a model for the Zero Emission Vehicle Mobility Center for Sac State. On February 6th, they will meet with Lufthansa to encourage direct flights to SMF. And on February 7th, they will meet with Bosch to continue to strengthen the relationship and foster further investment in the area. February 8th, they will meet with Siemens in Munich. February 9th, they will meet with SMA Solar. And February 10th, they will return home. Remember that economic development as a department promotes Placer County, especially to targeted businesses. So we carefully consider spending on advertising and travel to promote industrial opportunities. Some of our advertisers charge far more than the cost of this trip for a half page ad to promote Placer County. And those are very specific magazines that reach people who determine where these large investments are made. Your board has invested tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure and it's time to invest in recruiting businesses so you can start gaining the return on your investment. The Placer County Board of Supervisors Governance Manual and Rules of Procedure require your board to approve out-of-state overnight travel, which is why this item is before you today. With that, I respectfully request that you consider the approval for out-of-state travel for Supervisor Gore and Principal Management Analyst Paul Griffith. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, <clears throat> Gloria. I'm gonna bring it to the board. 
Anyone have any questions or comments? Supervisor Holmes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I only wish I was going because he's breaking Deutsch, but um, I think this is really a valuable trip, and uh, I, I support it. Uh, I know we've got the Bosch project, $1.5 billion, and we need to, we need to uh, leverage that and expand that and, and tell everybody in Deutschland uh, how important it is to Placer County and encourage them to uh, come in because this will uh, expand uh, more and more businesses of that type to come to Placer County. So I'm in full support. Any other comments? Supervisor Gustafson? No. Oh. I was just going to make a motion, but I realized I need to take public comment. So. Okay. Uh, public comment. Anyone from the audience, please? Well, thank you again, Mike Garabedian. So this is an eight-day trip to Germany and forty-five hundred dollars for two county, uh, county supervisor and someone else. Um, it's an opportunity. I don't know if we'll have an opportunity to look at some of the history related to Bosch or uh, other things, uh, you know, other other uh, cultural things that I'd be happy to talk about in, in private with anybody going. Um, so. Uh, uh, a little anecdote, I mean, I, it, I just, and I hate, to, I don't mean to focus on Bosch, but uh, the bureaucracy in Germany is quite different than bureaucracy here, as some of you may know in detail, who might have spent time there. I mean, a good example was uh, going into a, a public agency with a question and a need and finding out the person's on vacation, and nobody else gets the person to do that job while they're on vacation. You're, they're just, you're just out of luck if that, if that happens. So, uh, and you know, there's a lot of history there that anybody should know if they're going there. Um, it was I was there on March 8th one time when uh, in the, the old um, Western Berlin, uh, there was f flagging and flags on the poles and celebration. And then as soon as you got into the old, uh, the other side, the, uh, uh, it was nothing. It was dead, you know, there was no. But anyway, um, th th there's a history there. The Polizzi prison there is really revealing about what happened to pe people, ordinary citizens, and um, that's in Berlin, I mean. But any, uh, really, I've probably said too much uh, about, about you know, history we, we all know about and uh, that, that uh, com many companies like Bosch had a strong reputation in its leadership for resisting uh, the Nazi. Uh, 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 um, so I don't mean to focus on them. Anyway, good luck if you go, but I think it's an unneeded expense. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, anyone else? Anyone online? Okay. Um, I just want to make a comment. I'm with Supervisor Holmes. I'm jealous. <laughs> we want to be going. And having lived in Germany for a total of six years since my husband was in the Army, if it's anything like it was when we were there, you will thoroughly enjoy yourself. And um, I hope you have lots of luck connecting with all of those companies and, and, and everything. Good luck. Have a, have a good, safe trip. Very fruitful trip. Is it too late to add additional public comment? Can, can we allow? Okay, since we haven't closed the... <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. John Freitas again. And um, I, too, think this is a fabulous opportunity for growth in Placer County. It uh, may take us out of first gear into second gear of a five-speed. And um, I um, have a s friends and family... Uh, within the state, and I think uh, with the opportunity for jobs, we may see additional growth. Um, my only comment that I'd like to make comment here is, if I understand the proposal is for two individuals from the staff of the county, correct? Correct. One board, one supervisor, and one member from the economic development department. I, I guess it may come in the future, but. Could there be potential attendance of uh, a mayor, somebody of the city level that could attend as an advocate and a, you know, coming back and pitching it? Well, there are 15 members uh, total traveling, and it is part of the, we have the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council, which is hosting the trip, and they all are working on economic development for the entire Sacramento area that will be going to the, on this trip. 
It may include a mayor. I have no idea. The mayor of Roseville may be attending. I'm not certain, but there are a couple of members from the city of Roseville that are attending as well. Their economic development staff and probably somebody from their council yeah. to do the same type of thing that we are looking at doing, which is sharing yeah. how great this community is and encouraging them to relocate and invest um, their businesses here in our area. Thank you both for entertaining my comments. I don't think that's <laughs> takes place, but thank you and have a good year. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Okay, back to the board. Supervisor Gustafson. I was ready? just going to echo that I'm jealous, but I'll, I'll make a motion. <laughs> okay, um, only like 30 degrees, 40 degrees. I know. It's it not will be, be cold, but it will be magical. <laughs> Probably so. not bad for Cindy could accommodate. It's yeah. She's used to that by now. So I'll move approval. I will second. All right. Having a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Any opposed or abstaining? And hearing none, the motion passes. Okay, so we're on 10B. Good morning. I turn it off or turn it on? Okay. Uh, so item B is Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Pilot Program, Program Report and Grant Acceptance. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Jones, members of the board, Mr. Chatney and Ms. Schwab. I'm Melissa O'Neill with your County Executive Office, and with me today is Estelle Maxwell with Code Enforcement. And also behind us is Chris Puhuli, your Planning Director, and Ben Brano, also from Code Enforcement. We are here to request the following actions of your board, which I will read now into the record. Receive a report on the Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Pilot Program and provide direction on the potential continuation and funding of the program. Action two, approve and authorize the county executive officer or designee to accept a grant in the amount of $175,000 from the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation to fund Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Programming in Eastern Placer County and to sign the grant funding contract and any required documents. And action three, approve a fiscal year 2023-24 budget amendment number AM-00921, increasing appropriations for CC-10018, community and agency support in the amount of $175,000. We'll begin our presentation with a summary of the Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Pilot Program. As your board will recall, the pilot program was developed with the goal of assisting residents in unincorporated Placer County who are elderly or disabled and with low income who are challenged to maintain defensible space in their homes. The program officially launched in December 2022 with $300,000 allocated to the program by your board over two fiscal years, and 60 residents have been served by the program in that time. All funding has been utilized with the last applicant approved early in January 2024. I'll now turn the presentation over to Estelle for details on the program. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair and Board members. Um, thank you for allowing us to present to you a summary of this program that has helped 60 senior and or disabled community members in the unincorporated Placer County areas. I have included some before and after photos of a few of the properties that benefited from the Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Program. In the first photo, um, this was a home in Dutch Flat that had overgrowth on top of the roof within 10 foot of the roof line in most areas surrounding the home. On this photo, this is a property that was covered with overgrown shrubs and downed trees throughout. And this photo is another property of a property of a land that was covered with dead shrubs and trees that needed to be limbed up and cleared of the hazardous vegetation. This is a property that was in Lincoln and it had an ADU on site that the tree had overgrown the entire roof line and it covered the structure and began draping down the sides of the building. This property had not had any maintenance done to the vegetation since the homeowner's husband had passed away several years prior. As you can see, the entrance was so overgrown that the emergency services if they needed to access the residence, they would not have been able to use the driveway to um, get access to the home. This is another photo of that same property at the entrance of the home, and you can see that the shrubs 
um, in the photo on the left that the shrubs were beginning to grow into the side of the home and overtake the stairs that were entering the dwelling. This is a photo of a property where a large pine tree had fallen down due to the storms and the homeowner um, was previously widowed and had no means to remove the tree. This photo is a photo of a very large oak tree that fell during last year's storms and the property owner had no means to clean it up either. And this is another property that had dead shrubs and dry weeds surrounding the dwelling that needed to be cut down and removed. Through this program, I have come to a better understanding of the need for the Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Program. I have interacted with each and every one of the applicants that utilize the program and seen firsthand not only the need for the program like this in our community, but also the relief and gratitude of the residents served by the program. We have provided feedback from many of the residents served by the program as an attachment with their packet to this item. This concludes my portion and I'll hand it back over to Melissa. Okay, this map shows the distribution of the residents served by the program. Applicants were spread across much of the county with the majority located in the Foothills region. As noted in the first action of this item, staff would like to determine board interest in continuing this program with ongoing funding dedicated to it. County staff have also continued to seek additional funding for this program via grants, and we were recently notified that we were selected for a grant from the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation through their Forest Futures Grant Program. This grant is for $175,000 with no county match requirement. If approved by your board, this grant would fund defensible space fuels reduction activities in the Eastern Placer region within the boundaries served by the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, which are the same as the Tahoe Truckee Unified School District boundaries as shown on the next slide. The program would be developed based on the framework already approved by your board with minor adjustments specific to the East Placer region in collaboration with regional fire districts. Here's the map showing roughly the region that would be served by this grant program. Staff would work closely with the regional fire districts to raise awareness of the program and to engage potentially eligible residents within the program area. This is a one-year grant program that ends December 2024. That concludes our presentation, and we welcome any questions or comments you may have. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for questions or comments. Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you. Um, great presentation, and thank you for, uh, for the innovations that it took to do this pilot program, and I know how much the residents appreciated it. Um, and thank you for securing the grant for the eastern side as well to further uh, the footprint, as we know there's many areas that could use this assistance. Um, my questions are two. Um, one is um, how much of the money that we leveraged as we look at, because you've also asked for policy direction in the memo, of the 300000 we've leveraged, how much is that leveraged in the homeowners paying anything? Have they, have they paid any money into the program, into the improvements on their properties? So this, this is uh, framed as a, like a grant program, so okay. it's, it's free for the residents. It's, so it's totally free. The folks that qualify are, are low income. They're low income, but they do own a property, mm -hmm. right? And at some point that property will pass to someone else. And I guess my question is, can we create some sort of revolving fund where we help lean that property, basically lend them the money to get this work done, they stay in the house, five, ten, however many more years, but at some point the county has a, some sort of revolving fund to replenish it that we can regain it at, at sale. Um, because I want to help these people do this work, but I also want to see that there's a contribution um, because there is a property value there. We don't want to force them to sell to afford these improvements, but we do, I could see the benefit in continuing this, uh, and especially knowing that in five years, from all the standards we hear, probably five to seven years, it's gonna to have to be retreated. So um, I would look yeah. to Ben Brano to provide some additional insight, but it sounds like what you're talking about is similar to uh, the, the abatement process, mm -hmm. which if folks aren't able to provide the, um, the level of work needed, um, their properties would go into abatement, the property would be abated, and then we would place a lien on the property, which would then be reimbursed. Um, and the goal of this program originally was to avoid folks having to have liens on their property. 
Um, but but if but definitely if that's the interest of your board, that's that's what would naturally happen. Well, it's happen. one thought because I have a lot of interest and a lot of, of funds that should go to many many great causes here. But I I do need to look at what what is fair. It, these are not um, they may be fixed income and disabled and have issues, but they do own a piece of property in Placer County that is increasing in value and. So I, I, I'm trying to look for a fair balance. Uh, you know, I don't want to not have people participate. Our goal is to get this work done. But if there is a way to sustain it, you were asking for policy direction. I'd like to at least explore that. I'm completely supportive of funding this for the coming year while we work on that. I don't want to stop us from helping people treat this. But if we're going to do this long term, it would be good to have some sort of sustaining um, umbrella and not uh, just um, not every year have to allocate more money because we could spend quite a bit more. As you know, you've, you've treated these. so And we, we did look to this as a one time for each resident. So. For each resident mm -hmm. they get at one time mm -hmm. and in five years then, or seven years, when it grows back, then they're going to need to do it. Okay. Okay, Supervisor Holmes. Truckee uh, Community Foundation, those funds will be spent in the Truckee Tahoe area? Yes, oh. that was a grant uh, requirement. <clears throat> okay. Has, and I think I asked somebody about the Placer Community Count Foundation, whether someone has reached out to them yet uh, to see if they could put some kind of a program together like that for the people in, North, in, mm -hmm. in the Western Slope. With, with this grant application, that, that is the plan. We, we, we were actually approached by the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. Uh -huh. It wasn't it, uh, a funding source that we had considered, and I'm not sure why, but we certainly plan to approach the Placer Community Foundation and other community organizations as well. All right, good, thank you. Good, and Supervisor Gore. Uh, excellent idea, uh, Supervisor Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I am supportive of continuing the funding as well. Quick question, where was, where did we get the $300,000 from? Was that, that was general, general fund? fund? Mm -hmm. So I hear your desire about finding ways to sustain a fund, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you, you can put your heads together. I really don't ever want to end up into a place where a piece of property ends up in a lien because we provided some type of grant program Mm -hmm. But maybe there's a way to do something, or maybe there's a way to have some sort of creative funds from a biomass facility. I don't know. Uh, maybe one day we'll have a biomass facility or two yeah. in the area. Um, but I see that need. Um, and th I would love to have you put on your thinking caps, but then also move forward with um, additional funding for this next year. Okay, anyone else? Um, my question would be, um, what kind of criteria do you have? Do you have any other criteria besides uh, qualifying for their income? So folks have to be seniors or disabled, and so we require evidence of age or disability in order to qualify them on top of the income requirements. And we review income documentation as well as age or disability documentation. Oh, okay. And your age, is that anything like, is it a 55 or older, or do you have It's like 65 or older. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Just had to ask. <laughs> We're all creeping there. <laughs> Hopefully get there one day. Okay. Are um, there any comments from the public would like to comment on this? Last topic of the day for me. And <laughs> Just ideas. I, and I don't know what you've explored, but um, was there consideration to look into insurance companies? because I would see a benefit of the insurance company having the reduced risk of fire wanting to provide assistance for this. Um, I see it on the auto side. Some insurance companies have their own tow trucks so they can control the cost of tow services. It may be something to look at and it may be something even at a state level through the insurance commissioner the other idea I thought of while I was sitting there was um, inmates, uh, correctional uh, um, prisoners. Um, while they're serving their time, can they be 
escorted to these properties to reduce the fuel exposure. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Anyone else in the audience? Okay. Do we have anyone online? No, Chair. All right. Hearing none, we'll bring it back to the board. All right. We have a motion I'll and second. I just really quick. Do you want to speak to the um, use of probation? Might folks be a good in probation. Idea. At least I know on the chipper program they do. Do they do in this instance as well? So the the chipper program used to utilize inmates. And um, with some public safety realignment, we have um, higher risk inmates within mm -hmm. the Placer County Jail. Yeah. Um, and that coupled with a few other reasons um, made it just not feasible for us to utilize inmates in this capacity on private property, especially with residents that are vulnerable like these folks are. Um, the chipper program now utilizes probationers and those folks are uh, highly vetted to be safe to have on these types of properties. We've received rave reviews. Um, this program actually works in tandem with the chipper program and uh, Estelle has made contact with Placer RCD to call in the chipper program to support properties where more work was required than the money could, further than the money could go to provide that service. And also for folks that just sort of um, slipped under the cracks in terms of meeting our guidelines for this program, RCD has stepped in and assisted those folks as well. Great, thank you for that information. Okay, we have a motion. And a second. And a, and a second. second. There we go. Um, all those in favor? We need a roll. Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call. I've got to read my script. Holmes. Aye. Gustafson. Aye. Gore. Aye. Landon. Yes. Jones. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are going to um, adjourn. We are going to adjourn to closed session, and we will see you all after following closed session. I need to read it. In the right. Okay. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session to consider three items of existing litigation on the regular agenda and three items of existing litigation on the supplemental agenda. The board will also consider three potential cases under anticipated litigation and four potential matters of initiation of litigation on the supplemental agenda, one item of public employee performance, and one item of public employment. Okay. And we are adjourned. Once you have them.
motion to consider the following. Ryan Freidenberg versus Quail Ridge Apartments et al. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. Placer County Sheriff's Office versus Kevin Joseph Murray, Murphy, pardon me. The board heard a report, no action requested or taken. Brian Taylor versus County of Placer. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. Moving over to the supplemental agenda, in Ray under existing litigation, in Ray Eric Bakulik, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. In Ray Derek, John Derek Salee, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. In Ray Ryan West, the board heard potential matters, the board heard a report on each and provided direction on each on a 5-0 vote. The board then considered public employee performance evaluation for county executive officer, no action taken. The board then conducted interviews for public employment for the director of the Department of Public Works. The board provided direction, no, act, no formal action taken. That concludes the report out of closed session. Good, thank you very much. So we'll move on to item 11, uh, 2024 board and commission assignments. And Megan is going to present. All right. Good afternoon. It's always a little weird to sit on this side of the table, but <laughs> good afternoon, board members. Um, we are here today to talk about the 2024 board and commission appointments. So I want to take a moment and just say thank you to all of you for reviewing your assignments, ranking them, and submitting that back to me. Having gone through that and reviewed it, there is consensus on much of the appointments with minimal changes and the changes that there are were, um, were agreed upon by all. There are, however, two committees that I will be asking for direction from the board on, and then we do have one recommendation on a change to your list uh, to add a committee to a district-centric. So I'll dive into this, and we're just gonna go through the, co the appointments one by one. So starting up, we come up with Criminal Justice Policy Committee, CSAC, Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council, and NACO. These have no requested changes from last year. Um, everybody's, you know, they wanted to continue with membership as was, and there was no rankings that, you know, were conflicting with one another. Uh, also, I should state, we're working in the tier one, so these are kind of those committees that have a little bit more activity and are on the larger scale. Uh, next page, Rural County Representatives of California, RCRC, uh, Golden State Connect Authority, which is a subcommittee of RCRC, and Golden State Finance Authority, which is also a subcommittee of RCRC. So this was an area where there was change. The primary would remain the same with District 3. The alternate would change with District 5 coming off and District 2 taking that place. And then... SACOG. This is another area where we are recommending a change. This is an area where District 1 would be moving into the primary, or out of the primary seat and into the alternate seat, and uh, District 4 moving into the primary seat with District 1 into the alternate seat. Is there anything that we want to discuss on those Tier 1 appointments? Okay. So I'm going to move on to general appointments. Air Pollution Control District, no changes from last year. Uh, Area 4 Agency on Aging is the same, no changes from last year. County Audit Committee would remain the same, District 2 and District 3. Economic Development Board, this is an area where we do have change. This would be District 4 coming off of the primary seat and District 1 moving into the primary seat. First Five Children and Families Commission, and Flood Control and Water Conservation District Board of Directors would remain the same as last year. Uh, then moving to Golden Sierra Job Training Agency and Homeless Task Force Committee, no changes at this time recommended to those. Uh, that does bring us to where I need board direction. So Local Agency Formation Commission, as it was done last year, District 2 and District 5 were the primary seats with District 3 serving as an alternate, though there was an agreement among members that they would split that alternate so that there was a voting during certain types of items on LAFCO. 
The request that I have received is for there to be two primary positions and one alternate position and not split based off of the LAFCO agenda. So I would like the, to get a little direction from the board on that. And we can do that now at this time or if you want to continue going through and hold the direction for later, I can do so. Board? I'm okay doing it now, but it, I'll leave it up to you. On if this, you'd like sure. to do it now, then I say we'll address it now. Yeah. Um, well, this request came from me, and um, I had, so last year when I was appointed to LAFCO as one of the primaries, um, I was, um, Supervisor Holmes requested splitting the, that primary seat with me so that he could address MSR concerns and fire issues, which I was actually very comfortable with and happy to do because I was brand new and didn't really know much about fire. So. Um, I'm definitely still not an expert on fire, but I do feel like I have a grasp of LAFCO now and understand um, who I need to go to when I have fire questions. And so I think it's been somewhat confusing um, from a audience perspective because we will often, all three of us, be at a LAFCO meeting and I will come up for a portion of the meeting and then Supervisor Holmes will come up for another portion of the meeting to vote on something else. And um, so I think it's a little bit confusing. And since um, I now feel ready to take on the responsibility, I would like to request that we just stick with, go back to the original, which is two primaries and one alternate. So <clears throat> let me give you my take on that. <clears throat> I've been involved in the fire service issues since 30 years, for 30 years. <clears throat> <clears throat> served on a fire district board for 16. I have been uh, instrumental in working with fire districts, at least four fire districts, actually engaging with them and working with them to get ballot measures passed so they have sustainability. <clears throat> if you look at the Newcastle Fire Station, if it wasn't for me, that station would not have been built. I worked with the community in Newcastle <clears throat> Uh, the board at that time was not taking any action. We got community members together. We put a parcel tax on the ballot and it passed by 72%. <clears throat> After that, people in the community were all in an uproar. They thought this was uh, egregious. It was waste, fraud, and abuse. So they put another measure on the ballot to rescind it. I fought against that and prevailed. <clears throat> but the new board was elected <clears throat> and decided to go a different route. So they spent a lot of money that had already been spent to move forward with the fire station. <clears throat> but after, the, after they finally agreed to build the fire station, they spent a quarter of a million dollars filling up a hole uh, in the ground so they could have the, the base for their fire station. <clears throat> County Treasurer was willing to loan them to almost $3 million to build the fire station. By the time they, by the time they got to actually building it, the costs went up over a million dollars. <throat> One of the fire district members called me and said, hey, we're in a bind, what can we do? I said, let me see what I can do. <clears throat> so I called the Department of Agriculture Rural Development, told them the story. I had the, one of their assistant directors come up and met, meet with me, and we went over the process, and they said, yes, I think we can do that. So then uh, we worked with the fire board and realized that this was a doable deal. And it, it was a 40 year loan, but we actually got the fire district, the fire station built. They had to cut, when they were originally passed, it was supposed to be have a community room. The community room is no longer there. They had to cut all kinds of expenses that were supposed to be put, put into place. And so again, I'll reiterate, if I hadn't been stepped in with my background, I don't think that station would have been built. Furthermore, there have been multiple municipal service reviews over all these years. I have one in my office from 1966. Those service reviews always come out and what happens to them? They get put on the shelf. Now is the time we've got new service reviews coming out from all the fire districts, the cities, you need someone there that understands those and knows how to give direction and move forward. So that's why I think it's important for me to be involved in those issues. 
May I ask a question? Yes, you may. Ask so I appreciate that background, Supervisor Holmes. Um, and my question about LAFCO, um, since I haven't served on it um, recently, and there's been a lot of work, right? I know they're taking on a lot of MSRs. What are the areas that are focusing on? I know there's the issue of fire and fire services and consolidation, perhaps. What are some of the other projects they're working on? <coughs> The, the most thing is sustainability because they've all they never all their expenses are out of their control and they never have enough revenue to catch yeah. up. I'm not I'm not not just the fire, but like aren't are they looking at like a? I, I understand the city of Rosehill is looking at um, yes. perhaps annexing Curry yeah. Creek, or what are some of the other other than fire? What are some of the other projects LAFCO is reviewing under their purview? I think because it's. They, they do more than just the fire, so I'm, yeah, I'm just think, trying to get over. Uh, yeah, I think what, one of the most things that, that Supervisor Landon was concerned about was all the annexation and the projects going on in Lincoln, which is fine. She can handle that. But I still think that I have a, a great opportunity and a lot to, to give as far as fire service in Placer County. So there's a number of um, annexations coming forward um, in the next year uh, as well. So we're going to be dealing with both of those issues. On the LAFCO board. So annexations primarily in West Roseville, mm -hmm. yeah. yes, Auburn, but also Lincoln. I mean, oh, it'll come back West with Lincoln, 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 West yeah. Placer County. Yeah. Right. right. And then the fire. And districts. Auburn's doing their sphere of influence study too. That may produce something. So there's a number of those being looked at. So <clears> the Rockland, Roseville, uh, Lincoln's will come back. Village Five will come back in a different format. Yeah. So. Okay. We're still waiting for Forest Hill to bring in their all their information. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no doubt Supervisor Holmes has done a tremendous job in, in representing his district and his constituents, and a lot of the work that he explained was not LAFCO work. It was more, you know, getting, securing funds for those projects and understanding, and I think it's really challenging when we sit here and many of us gave up committees we wanted to be on because we're, we realize there's five of us and we have to share. <laughs> Sharing isn't always easy in what we want to give up or what we want to stay on. And so I don't know how to deal with um, two supervisors wanting and both having great experience. We have past experience and we have future looking experience. Like where, how are we going to look at these um, moving forward? So. I, I just I have a hard time telling you know telling you two to arm wrestle last year we tried to split the baby because the same issue came up but we do uh, have a lot of committees here and they're not proportionally set out with time or, or effort um, they're they're you know I would argue that TRPA probably takes as much time as several of the tier one committees put together as far as the amount of time um, I have to put in on that one yeah. um, so I how do we weigh these and how do we make this decision I don't have a good answer on that can can you clarify for me the the problem here because the way you list it is you have two primaries and an alternate what yes so what what we're looking for is we are looking what is a vote from the board on what board members will serve as the two primaries and what board member member will serve as the alternate as they stated last year, there was an agreement amongst the board members to sort of split that. That agreement was made in the board meeting and was on the record. At this point in time, that agreement is no longer standing. The request is to have two, two primaries and an alternate, and they would not split the meetings based on the topics coming in front of LAFCO. So, I mean, and what we're looking for is a vote for who those primary positions will go to and who those alternate positions will go to. The listing as it shows on the PowerPoint is solely of what it looks of right now based off of last year. It does not reflect the agreement that the board members had for last year. And you know, I will just add, I, I fully respect Supervisor Holmes' institutional knowledge and understanding of FIRE and so I, you know, let him know that I, very much want to engage him in the conversation and so if there is an item coming that is related to an MSR or fire I would be more than happy to reach out to him and have a conversation and get his perspective and history 
um, and insight because I, I do think that's part of the role of someone of a commissioner is to get information from all sources and so I consider him an asset and a resource and um, would be more than happy to utilize him in that way if he was willing. Well, and I think uh, I, I would say that all of us, our job is to represent the full board on these committees. We're not representing ourselves, and our, you know, we're, we're there with using our judgment because the rest of the board trusts us. And if we violate that trust, then um, we've seen board members removed from committees for such actions. So I know you will do that. I know think he would do that with you as well. <laughs> I know you will do it because I've seen you reach out and, and talk to me many times about it. So. Well, for the sake of not making us, making one of you have to decide whether you make a motion, I will make a motion um, to approve the, what is on the PowerPoint, I guess, is that how I say it? Two primaries, one alternate, traditional sense. That would be my motion. And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and second that only because I've seen an experience with um, SACOG in the city of Roseville where they had two council members, one served on the board and one served on the committee, and it just was confusing. It just didn't work as well, um, splitting up, sort of splitting the baby type of thing. Um, and while I, it's a, it's a, it's a great, organization to be on and important that we have good representation. Um, I don't think any of us, I mean, we all have an opportunity to give input even if we weren't at the board um, or sitting on the board. And so I'll, I'll, I'll second that motion, although I totally appreciate um, Jim, you serving on LAFCO for I think all these years prior. Can, can I just make a just sort of a recommendation? is that if you if there is something specific to fire coming up on an, an agenda maybe you let him participate as an alternate and and you not go to that specific meeting um i mean we i could that was basically what we did this last oh. time oh um, okay and you're trying to get yeah. away from that okay then motion and a second i guess we have to do a roll call i mean not a roll call but a all those in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. I mean, is that what you're torn. Are you asking? I know. Me? I'll let you no, I, all those in favor, please say aye, and I'm, I'm, I'm torn myself. I know the difficulty in trying to get on a committee, but. Um, well, yeah, I was going to okay. say, we can roll call this. All right, go ahead and do a roll call. You can start with me. <laughs> Gore. Aye. Landon. Yes. Holmes. Aye. Gustafson. Aye. Jones. I in, in that case, yes, I'll do. <laughs> Supervisor Holmes. Okay. Thank you, okay. Thank you all, very much, all of you. So, moving on, this brings us to the next committee. This is the Local Remote Access Network Board, uh, the RAN Board. Uh, no quite, no word changes requested. District Three would remain on. No, Is there any other controversy? We can't. I was going to say, do you guys want me to just skip through and say no changes, and then we'll get to the, there's only two more flat slides with changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless great. anybody has a change if there's that they an want. issue, I thought it yeah. was. Yeah. So mental health, middle fork, older adult, pioneer community, all remaining the same. PCTPA, South Placer, Sparta, subcommittee, Sierra Sacramento Valley, medical assistant, and treasury review panel, all remaining the same. These are the district-centric committees. Uh, Auburn City Council, Placer County Liaison, the same, Consolidated Oversight Board, Successor Agencies, Highway 65 Joint Powers, Placer Conservation Authority, Roseville City, Placer County Liaison Committee, no changes to any of those. Lincoln Sewer Maintenance District 1, Wastewater Authority, Consolidated Oversight Board of the Successor Agencies of the County of Placer, no changes. Sierra Nevada Conservancy, South Placer Regional Transportation, Sparta, and Tahoe Conservancy, Ta uh, TRPA, Tahoe Transportation District, and this brings us to our last and final staff requesting direction. So the Tribal County Advisory Committee, this is a committee that was originally formed back when we were initially in the process of building the casino. At that point in time, the, the county didn't quite have a relationship with the tribe, so this committee was formed and utilized to build that relationship. The committee has not been active in over, 
probably 10 years. The reason that we have not disbanded is it still is as an active committee and could be brought back into play should we ever have the need to meet again with the tribe on arising issues or matters. At this time, though, this, this committee does not meet. Um, the requests that I have right now are from District 2, from District 3, and from District 4 to serve on this. Uh, last year, as you can see, it was, district, it was represented by District 3 and District 4. We also later on in the PowerPoint do speak to this because the other request that has come through is that uh, this move to a, right now it's district, it's listed as district centric. And the reasoning for that is that we designate the tribe, we designate district two because that's where the casino is. We would, we do recommend changing this and also putting the representation from district five onto this as district centric as most of the tribe land does lie within district five. So what I'm looking for right now on this current one is just to get a vote on who the two primary members on the tribal county advisory committee will be. Um, there may be willingness to compromise on this, but the requests that came through were, were you know, from all the districts. So I just need direction going forward. Megan, can I ask a question? Yeah. This last year, so on my printout of the PowerPoint, it says last year it was Two and four? Oh, no. La I apologize. Last year it was not. It was oh, three and four. Oh, I thought I was on it. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I'm sorry. And, no, and there was there was a lot of conversation around this because yeah. it was listed as district centric. So it so was it three did, and four this last year. It was year. three and four last year. And there was yeah. last year what we had settled on was we had elected the chair and vice chair to serve on it last year. Oh. So that's how we came to it last year, even with it being district centric. Um, so it, it, it really is. A, whatever the board would like to see. And again, do we really need it? I mean, honestly, we have I, to make an appointment to it because it is still technically an active committee. But can't it, it, we just get rid of a committee that's not being utilized. But for many reasons based around this, we, we have spoken with council and we have chosen to keep it active okay. at this time. That's fine. <laughs> Sometimes there's issues that come up that, and I, I've been involved in them when the chair and the vice chair met and at one time it was Robert and I that just met. Well, there's issues come up and it's just a good way, the sheriff's office is there, fire department. It's a good way to connect with the tribe and their, their governing board. Well, I'll make the comment that last year, I know when I talked to you about it, you said that if, if they were to have a meeting that you'd like to get back on the tribal commission, but they've had no meetings. No, right. <laughs> And I guess it's been a number of years, no, you said, since they've had they any meetings. I would like to continue on it, m maybe in the capacity of chair or, you know, but I would like to continue on it. Were you also, though, making a recommendation that it would be tribal s or district centric, meaning it'd be two and five because the casino is in now district two and the tribal lands off in of Indian Hill Road is district five i think we can uh, personally i think we can wait to make that change till next year and just well i need to leave so i have an appointment at four off site so i would just suggest that we can make that district discussion next year absolutely and i'm fine with leaving it here i know most a lot of the lands are there but i talk to the tribe anyway so i don't need to be on the committee so how was it previously, the chair and vice chair? Last, so last year we did, we went with the chair and vice chair. So um, the old, ultimately I just need to know if we, what we're looking for on this for going forward. I, Shanti, you had, you had requested a seat on this on your form, partially because you thought you served on it. So if yeah, there's, I keep going. <laughs> if there's no question, we can leave it as is. Like I said, this one is, is kind of an oddity because we are speaking of something that will likely not meet again this year. Yeah, that's fine with me. I'm fine okay. with keeping it. So we'll leave this one as is and move forward. Okay, Western Plaster Waste Management Authority. This one remains the same. Uh, and then these are your appointments that are just set by district or term or, you know, designated within the bylaws of things. The only other one you'll see is the Eastern Placer Fire Service Ad Hoc. Ad Hoc committees, we just don't rotate because we, it, it serves us better to have the supervisors originally appointed remain on for the remainder of the committee. Uh, 
quick question on the yes. Veterans Advisory Council. Are we, is that rotating each year? It is, it's okay. rotating each year. So you are, you are moving into rotation this year and that is set by their bylaws. Got it, okay. And then last but least is the Veterans Memorial Hall Boards. So, and these are, you guys are appointed to all of these by code. So um, you can appoint alternates to them. That happens outside of this process, but you do serve on those per the county code. Mm -hmm. These are the staff appointments. These are the same as they have always been. We, um, Stephanie Holloway, the deputy CEO in the Tahoe area serves as the alternate on the Tahoe Conservancy, Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, Tahoe Transportation District. This ensures that we have the correct knowledge base attending those meetings should the District 5 supervisor be absent. And then Solid Waste Local Task Force and Mountain Counties Water Resource Association, those we just designate to the CEO or designee. This is just the count of what everyone had. Um, I, I do want to point out a Supervisor Gustafson had said, the count is not necessarily even and doesn't depict the magnitude that some of these boards, uh, magnitude of your time that some of these boards take. So it is just a count. <clears throat> um, this was the request as stated by Supervisor Gustafson. She's fine letting this wait, so we'll bring the request to change the Tribal County Advisory. We'll bring that back next year. And Supervisor Gore, I will follow up with council to see if it is something that if we look again, if we want to continue moving forward. Um, so that being said, it brings us to our final recommendation, which is to review the 2024 boards and commissions to which supervisor are appointed list and provide any requested changes and consider assignments and provide direction to staff to bring back final appointments at the January 23rd, 2024 board meeting. Okay, so we need approval by the board? We do. I have my direction, and I just need approval by the board. Okay. Any public comments? You have one online? There's not online. Okay, okay, thanks, Bonnie. Yeah, anyone, anyone here would like to make a public comment? <laughs> All right. All right, well, then I will go ahead and uh, move approval of this plus changes that we agreed upon i'll second okay is this a roll call or just to all in favor all, all in favor, in favor. Oh. Aye. 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 aye okay all in favor motion passes thank you all thank you so i think this ends our meeting for today uh madam chair yes sir before you <clears throat> close <clears throat> last week we lost a longtime placer county uh sheriff he was jim weber Newcastle native. Um, he actually rose to the rank of undersheriff of Placer County. <clears throat> um, I'm very close to the family. Anyhow, uh, he passed away from Alzheimer's. And so I would just like to close the meeting in his memory. Thank you for that, for letting us know. Okay, I meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all.